recognition of guests, the Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and welcome back to my colleagues for Wednesday debate uh, in the Legislature, to all those who are tuned in at home, uh, and those who have joined us in the public gallery today. We're uh, fortunate to have with us today our Easter Seals Ambassador is in the gallery today, Lucy Galan from uh, Summerside, a student at the Col sur Mer. Uh, she is, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, the first ever Francophone ambassador in our history, and we're very, very proud of, of, of this. I want to welcome uh, Lucy and members of her family who are here, and of course, Helen Chapman, who is the CEO of uh, the Easter Seals, uh, uh, which is a wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, cause each and every year, and something that we can be proud of. And my colleague, uh, the Minister of Education in early years, will have much more to say about the uh, upcoming uh, ambassador tour and about our Easter Shields ambassador, but, but welcome. Um, uh, it was also announced yesterday, Mr. Speaker, that the junior achievement of Prince Edward Island uh, will be giving out uh, three lifetime achievement awards at their uh, uh, banquet in May. Uh, Fred Heinemann of Heinemann and Company, uh, Marguerite Conley of Marguerite Conley Training and Consulting, uh, and Brian Hempfill of Hempfill Chevrolet Buick GMC, uh, the latter uh, being my father-in-law, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I watched uh, Brian and Kathy uh, uh, run a very successful business uh, with integrity, with, with class for many, many years. Uh, he did it in his own uh, uh, quiet way, and uh, just uh, uh, I'm proud to be part of the Hempfill family and very, very honored to see Brian. Uh, Kathy and the Hempful family recognized uh, for this uh, uh, wonderful achievement along with Fred and Marguerite and all of their families and staff who put so much into these businesses. So to junior achievement, uh, I can say well done on those three. And I look forward to, uh, to attending that event, uh, not just as Premier, but as, uh, as a proud family member uh, at that event. I also wanted to say that uh, PEI's own Cameron Gordon and Megan Connors will be uh, participating in Canada's Got Talent uh, uh, and will be airing on Tuesday, March the 19th uh, after auditioning last fall following their performance at the local Dancing with the Stars fundraiser. Uh, it was announced just yesterday that they will be on this next season, so I encourage all Islanders to tune in and cheer them on. I know they'll make uh, PEI very proud. Uh, and speaking of making PEI proud, our, our own Tyler uh, uh, Smith, uh, who's representing PEI uh, and his rank from the Crapo Curling Club, had a big win yesterday against uh, Quebec to move to 4-1 to in the Montana's Briar in Regina. Uh, in a little bit tough today. They're not getting along so well in the game against the two-time defending champ, uh, Brad Gushu, for Team Canada, uh, but still very much in the playoff hunt and making a lot of really positive uh, news uh, for Prince Edward Island and for the team themselves, for the Crapple Curling Club. So just uh, to Tyler and the team, keep up the great work. We're rooting for you here. You've got a couple more games and uh, really pushing hard and hoping that you can get into the, into the playoffs on Friday. So thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Speaker. And I do want to welcome everyone back today and those who are viewing online and especially want to welcome to our gallery, our present uh, 2024 Easter Seals uh, Ambassador. Welcome, hailing from the, the beautiful city of Summerside. So it's nice to see <coughs> Prince County being represented. And uh, thank you for coming in today and to her family and, and to those with the organization. Thank you for all you do to support um, her and, and the upcoming year. So look forward to seeing you at the Tignish Elementary. Um, also, Mr. Speaker, while I'm on my feet, uh, today is the beginning of a four-day event. It's the 2024 Music PEI um, week and awards, so I want to congratulate all those who have uh, nominations and congratulate all the organizers and those who will be performing uh, throughout the next few days here in Charlottetown. Also tonight um, at the Tignus Seniors home there will be a Mardi Gras uh, for the residents and it's going to be a kind of like an indoor parade where Local businesses and organizations will have floats and they'll go around. Residents are all dressed up in costume um, at their doors. Uh, Emmy Callahan uh, Band will also be there participating, as well as many local, um, um, local entertainment. Uh, so it's going to be a great evening uh, for them. And I want to thank Michelle McDonald, who is the activities director there, and also the staff and all the volunteers 
who uh, participate or will be participating, who will organize this event because uh, it really puts a smile on our seniors. And tonight is um, game three of the Western uh, Seniors Playoff, and uh, Tignish Aces will be hosting the last year's champions, Wellington Flyers. Um, so it should be a good game, should be a good crowd there. Tignish leads that series to nothing, and hopefully after tonight it will be three nothing uh, in a best of seven. So thank you. Leader of the third priority. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and welcome back to all my colleagues and staff and pages today. A very special welcome to Lucy and her team who are joining us today. This is always a very exciting time of year, and you've got a very exciting year ahead of you. So I hope that you, you have lots of fun. Um, and uh, as was mentioned in here earlier, we uh, had some ongoing. This morning was the last of uh, the Carrie Wynnum McLeod Women of Impact Awards. Uh, that continued this morning. And so just to congratulate those three winners, uh, the winner in business, Della Parker, uh, in healthcare, Shalane Glant, and in community, Norma Dingwell. And uh, congratulations to these three trailblazers. And it was really expiring, inspiring to hear them on the radio um, over the last little bit. And that had an opportunity to have a coffee with, with Norma Dingwell after her stint on the radio this morning. And if you've ever met Norma, I don't know if you've ever met someone who radiates love and kindness and commitment to community like she does. And so very special congratulations to, to all three of those women. Also, Mr. Speaker, uh, this week marks the 26th annual PEI Construction Awards Women in Construction, where we celebrate all the accomplishments um, that, that women have made in this province in construction, and so I look forward to, to taking part in, in some things around that. Um, also, uh, echoing on from the Premier, I'd like to congratulate Fred Heim and Margaret Connolly and, of course, Brian Hempel on, uh, on being inducted into the Business Hall of Fame. That's a, a pretty prestigious award and, and very exciting, so I'd, I'd like to congratulate them. And also, as already been mentioned, but something that I always enjoy is, is Music PEI Week here in Prince Edward Island, and although I don't celebrate it like I used to when I was younger, um, it's still a really exciting time to showcase all of the local talent we have. And I'd love to hear, I'm sure that someone's done studies somewhere to look at the talent that PEI has, because I think that we are a very special place when it comes to artists and, and creative uh, people in general. And so um, a really exciting week, and congratulations to all of the nominees and, and everyone who works really hard on this. And I look forward to taking part in some of those shows and, of course, the, the gala on Sunday. And with that, Mr. Speaker, I wish everyone a good day. Thank you. The member for Charlottetown Belvedere. Mr. Speaker, and welcome to all those in the gallery today and all those that are watching from uh, online, especially District 11. Um, today I rise to acknowledge Kim Griffin and Jennifer Evans. Both ladies have been recognized as two of the Atlantic Canadian 25 Most Powerful Women in Business 2024. Jennifer Evans is the Director of Operations for Stingray Radio and has spent more than 30 years in, broadca in the broadcasting industry. Kim Griffin is the Sustainable Manager and Spokesperson for Maritime Electric, as well as the President of the Charlottetown Area Chamber and Vice Chair of the Liquor Control Commission. Congratulations to you both on your well-deserved rewards. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Minister of Education in Early Years. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's certainly a pleasure to rise today. Welcome back to all of my colleagues. Hello to everyone tuning in from across the island, especially those tuning in from District 9, Charlottetown, Hillsborough Park. And a very special welcome to Lucy Gallon and her wonderful family, um, as well as Helen Chapman. It's such a pleasure to have you all with us here today. And I will be giving a, a statement, as the Premier had mentioned later on, um, with some more details. But just at a really high level, um, I've had the opportunity to join our Easter Seals ambassadors over the last couple of years, Veda Matheson, who you've met, and Caitlin and Megan Rogers. And in my time as Education Minister, those tours have been the most memorable days um, for, for all involved. And I know the ambassadors especially, the memories that you're going to make um, throughout those times, I know that um, they are going to impact you for the rest of your life. And 
I know that you're up for the challenge. I know that you're the right person for the job, and I'm so excited to see the impact that you're going to make across our school system over the coming months and across our province. So thank you for stepping up to the challenge, and thank you for being you, and thank you for sharing your voice. And I look forward to speaking more about your journey and the, the beginning of it here in the statement and uh, watching it as you progress here in the coming months. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Rustico Emerald. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. I wanted to rise and welcome everyone here today and everyone to, to the gallery. Great to see you. Of course, everyone watching from District 18, Rustico Emerald, Mr. Speaker. And I wanted to uh, give a shout out to our tourism operators who are preparing for the upcoming season. There's a lot of work to do and uh, by all accounts it should be a very a very busy season. And I wanted to also talk to, and give a shout out to our snowplow drivers, both the ones that work for the province and all the plethora of private snowplow or snow removal operators because they could have a, a very couple of long days coming up ahead. And uh, Mr. Speaker, I just wanted to give a big shout out to all of our community volunteers, you know. There are just some amazing things that are happening around the communities in my area, whether it be the Sterling Women's Institute and the Live Well PEI and all the, all the great things they're doing there. Or down at in the municip rural municipality of Bredalbin, they've got uh, particularly some poetry and some art-focused things. They've got a whole, a whole housing project they're trying to get off the ground. And Mr. Speaker, also community volunteers have to deal with a lot of diversity sometimes and, and issues. So those folks at the New London Community Complex, I know they all... I think they're going for a tough time there and and you know we've had our fair share of issues at the uh, Aliyahu Wellness Center in Rankin North Rustico but thank you to all the volunteers that stick with it through thick and thin to make it happen. Thank you Mr. Speaker. The uh, Minister of Workforce Advanced Learning and Population. Thank you Mr. Speaker and uh, it's a pleasure to rise today and welcome to all my colleagues and those our guests in the gallery and everyone at home in District 5, Mermaid Stratford. I wanted to rise today to do a shout out to our youth center, our Stratford Youth Center's annual walkathon is happening this weekend. This is a youth led initiative and a great fundraiser for our Stratford Youth Center um, and I encourage everyone to get out to support this uh, great event as they're accepting donations um, to help do all the great things they do in our community. Uh, thank you. The uh, member for Charlottetown Winslow and the Governor Whip. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's a pleasure to rise and welcome everyone uh, watching online from uh, District 10 Charlottetown Winslow today. It's uh, not uber often that you get to know someone in the gallery. I do want to, I can hardly wait for the Minister of Education to uh, read her statement today and hear a little bit more about your journey, but welcome you. And uh, of course, I texted my old boss, a lot of people in this room would know Scott Chapman uh, very well on Ocean 100 News, and I said my favorite Chapman is in the house today, so <laughs> I give a warm welcome to Helen Chapman. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, the Minister of Social Development and Seniors. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. It's a pleasure to rise today, and it's a pleasure to welcome all those in the gallery, especially Lucy, all the way from Somerset. Nice to have you here, Lucy. And I know that you're going to enjoy your tour, and I know you're going to have lots of fun doing that. And uh, welcome here today. And I just want to say hi to everybody home in District 22. And I would like to say a special hello to my brother-in-law, Wade, who's been in the Prince County Hospital in the PC, the, the Progressive Care Unit, for the last week. And he is getting excellent care. Um, and has been. It's the second time there in the last two weeks, and uh, he's been there a week today. And he just wanted me to, to let everybody know that he's doing well and, and getting the great care. Thank you. Uh, statements by members. We'll start with the member for Charlottetown, Wish Royalty. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last week, in response to questions regarding the reopening of the vital health care services at the PCH, the Premier's vague response exemplifies the government's evasion and lack of accountability, and left me thinking about the difference between responsibility and irresponsibility in terms of government. While isolated successes like the Scoot Food Program are acknowledged, they pale in comparison to the overarching trend of irresponsible governance. An abrupt closure of essential health care services in Summerside a mixed community outcry underscores blatant disregard for Islanders' needs. Fiscal management exemplifies by reckless spending without oversight through special warrants further erodes public needs. A $250,000 uh, seniors food program that only helps 16 seniors. 
The silencing of difference of opinions with health BEI leaders is emblematic of a government unwilling to address critical issues. Shovels in the ground, a shelter before the snow flies, 30 medical homes operational by the end of the year. Broken promises, inadequate communication, and prioritizing optics and messaging over actions have left Islanders facing unprecedented challenges. It's clear that this administration is failing its responsibility to govern effectively. It's time for the government to prioritize the needs of Islanders and demonstrate accountability through decisive, responsible action. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I was quite horrified by the level of personal bitterness dis on display here yesterday during a dramatic performance staged by the former leader of the third party and the Premier. And I really want to underline the word personal because this was clearly two men fighting out some kind of strange political breakup. Yesterday's drama was, in short, the sad conclusion to a misguided experiment of collaboration. Oh. I said misguided experiment for a couple of reasons. First, it is the essential job of opposition to hold government accountable. And that must be done through the lens of an adversary and opponent. Between 2019 and 2023, the third party fell for government's collaboration ploy. And instead of holding government to account, they became this government's sturdy right arm. Always reliable, always cooperative, always ready for a hug and a compliment. But we obviously come from a long way from the smiles and winks. From a mutual admiration society to, a, to desperate accusations of people in this house, and I quote, lining their pockets. From the opposition perspective, a grown-up government, a mature government that understands its obligations and responsibilities, well, a government like that values criticism over comedy and appreciates that its ideas will be tested publicly and in an open forum. And here it is, the 2024 reality. As this government spirals further and further into, absolute, into an absolute spectacle, as Islanders become more and more aware of their do-nothing mismanagement, this criticism will become more sharp. And those critical observations will not just come from this House. So I say to all of you, Learn to listen to those criticisms and act on them, because lashing out with storytelling and bitter attacks will not help one single islander. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Rustico Emerald. On a different note, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. <clears throat> for more than a century now, 4-H programs have been empowering PEI youth with a learn to do by doing philosophy. <laughs> And at the core of 4-H are the volunteers that organize the clubs and lead the many and varied projects that are offered. I want to recognize and send a huge thank you to all the 4-H leaders, but in particular today, it is a pleasure to rise to commend lifetime 4-H volunteer and leader, Nancy Orr. The annual general meeting and awards banquet for 4-HP I recently took place at the Rod Royalty Hotel, and during the banquet, Nancy was recognized for having achieved an amazing 45 years as a 4-H volunteer and leader. In particular, through her dedication to the Cavendish 4-H Club, she has had a direct and strong positive impact on hundreds, if not thousands, of 4-H members over the years. It is hard to overstate the profound influence she has had on the youth development and building leaders within our communities. Nancy embodies the 4-H Pledge, Mr. Speaker, consistently making sure she and her members use their heads for clearer thinking, hearts for greater loyalty, hands for larger service, and health for better living in service of community, country, and world. Most recently, Nancy is championing the 4-H Healthy Living Initiative to support the health and well-being of rural youth across Canada. And this initiative aims to equip volunteers and families with the knowledge to help identify youth in distress and provide access to, to the supports they need. And it focuses on mental health, physical health, my plate in the planet. It was developed because young people in rural and remote communities are especially susceptible to experiencing issues related to their mental and physical well-being. Mr. Speaker, please join me in sending a huge thank you to Nancy Orr for her 45 years of service to community as a 4-H volunteer, a great leader in a great organization. Questions by members, starting with responses to questions taken as notice. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So my question is for the Minister of Health. To say that people in Western Prince Edward Island are worried about health care is a massive understatement. Emergency room closures are far too common, and in fact, the emergency room at Western Hospital closed about 10% of the time last year. 
As discussed yesterday, the Collaborative Emergency Centre at Western will be closed for the foreseeable future. And yesterday, the Minister said, and I quote, the Collaborative Emergency Centre model is not really deployed across Canada. This seems to be the reason the Minister offers to abandon the health care needs of Western Prince Edward Island. So my question is, when did the Minister decide that the CEC model is not really worth pursuing? Mm. Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, again, I don't make those decisions, and um, again, we know it's a staffing issue to maintain that service in Western PEI. We are embarking, I think you'll see it in the budget, uh, on a master planning exercise for Western PEI that will help us deliver the services that we want um, and we can in that uh, region of P Prince Edward Island. So again, uh, I would make an operational decision on whether to open or close anything um, but again, we continue to work on Western PEI and how it will look for the next 5, 10, and 20 years. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. There's a long record of Conservatives trying to shut down the hospital in Alberton. In fact, the current member from, the district led, uh, this ex from that district led that exercise uh, some years ago, trying to shut down two hospitals in West Prince and put some kind of a substitute in Bloomfield. And step by step now, this government appears willingly short to shortchange services at Western, apparently in the hopes that people in the area will just eventually give up. Now, many people are saying to me that it's getting harder and harder to attract new residents because healthcare in West Prince is so unpredictable. Minister, so why is this constant erosion of services in the West? The Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, um, it's services we do want to provide with our growing population. Uh, we need to have all our facilities working as, uh, to full capacity w when we can, uh, staff them appropriately. If you just look back on the, the last five years, I was looking at numbers the other night, we've actually, um, since I think 2019, we've actually attracted the population of the city of Summerside plus the town of Cornwall to Prince Edward Island, so that does place pressures on our health care system um, in any part of PEI. So we'll continue to try to fill the gaps and provide the, the services in a safe way. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So that just confirms what I just said. We're not attracting people to West Prince because the health care is unpredictable. So I think we're seeing the same thing happening now at the Prince County Hospital in Summerside. This government is clearly not up to the job of maintaining services and the erosion of Prince County has begun. As services continue to deteriorate in the West, there is more and more concern being raised. People are wondering whether they can rely on this government to ensure health care access in Western Prince Edward Island. So, Minister, as this confidence continues to erode, what is being done to ensure that the CEC is a reliable service for people in Western Prince Edward Island? Minister of Health and Wellness. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and again, I, I, I'm going to take the Honourable Members uh, information uh, that sits in front of me that said that Alberton is one of the fastest growing communities on PEI, so I guess I dispute that, that claim. Um, he would know better than most as being the representative from that area. So again, we want to provide services at both O'Leary and Western and, and the PCH to serve everybody in Western PEI. We continue to make uh, changes in scope of practice and licensing pathways to uh, attract more health care workers to everywhere in Prince Edward Island, so we will continue to do that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Leader of the Opposition. Speaker. So yesterday we saw that the Medical Society of Prince Edward Island is asking for a pause on the medical school. And like myself, the Medical Society agrees that the potential school is worth exploring. But they are, they are worried that the work to prepare it has not been done. So my question is, is this government ready to put a pause on a medical school? <coughs> Minister of Health, or the Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I would say uh, my answer to that question would be uh, no. Um, I understand, I didn't see the conversation that was on television last night, but we are in receipt of a letter from the Medical Society as late as the 27th or 28th of February, I forget the exact date, uh, outlining how uh, we need to work together to develop uh, this initiative. Uh, nowhere in the letter does it call for a pause. And, and uh, But I would say to the Honourable Member what I have said to everybody is, uh, a, a pause for what? I mean, we, we know we're in a difficult situation with health care. It's not like there's a magical number of doctors that are going to appear in the next one or two or three years uh, that's going to make it all of a sudden you know, easier to do this. I mean, uh, uh, essentially what we've been talking about here is that um, you know, in uh, 18 months from now, in September of 2025, we'll have the first intake of students at UPEI. The first two years, they're largely um, 
going to be uh, in the classroom, uh, you know, uh, and, and it's not really until uh, late summer of 2028 when we need to start, you know, working with them and get them immersed into the healthcare system. And as UPEI has told us as late as yesterday uh, that they're in contact with 40 or 45 doctors in PEI who are wanting to work within the system. So I do think we have time uh, uh, to, to implement this, and I take those uh, uh, comments very seriously. And I know UPEI and Health PEI are working to try to address all of those, but uh, uh, I think uh, this is something we need to, we need to do uh, uh, because there, there's no magic bullet coming beyond it. Mr. Speaker. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, so the Medical Society um, address that, that they want to put a pause on it. So they put a red flag up. The CEO, former CEO of Health PI put a red flag up. Many others have put red flags up on this. It is very important that the physicians in Prince Edward Island, they have a very important role in this new medical school. So they have to be, um, there has to be some communication with them. This is our medical community we're talking about. Um, so they have a lot of uh, ex expertise in healthcare, obviously. They have more than the minister or more than the premier would have. Um, and more than anybody in the Premier's office would have. So surely the Minister is paying close attention to the doctors in this province. The President of the Medical Society said that the physicians have not been consulted or heard. So if the doctors of this province are worried, where on earth is the Minister getting his advice on this multi-million dollar project? The Honourable Premier. Uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, again, I would take exception to some of the comments uh, that are being put forward here simply because the Medical Society has been part of the uh, whole process uh, to date. Uh, they participated in the uh, 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 process to hire the new Dean of Medicine. They've been sitting at the table. Now, I don't know how the information gets dispersed within the group of physicians beyond that, but I do take very seriously uh, the, their need to have input. Uh, we believe they have had, but we want them to have more input. Uh, but again, as I say, uh, the, the announcement came in 2021. We're not going to really need to see uh, the healthcare system really accessed in any way, uh, and very uh, easily, in an, uh, you know, initially until uh, so late summer of uh, 2028. So I do think that should give us enough time. And as I say, UPEI has been working uh, diligently. They have consulted uh, and have interest between 40 and 45 doctors so far. And then they're working on, the, uh, on making sure that we can do this so it becomes an asset to the health care system, uh, Mr. Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition. Let's just be honest, Mr. Speaker. So this government can't even keep a small CEC, a, co a collaborative emergency care open in Alberton. <laughs> but they are attempting to launch a medical school here in Prince Edward Island. <laughs> So, I mean, good grief, Mr. Speaker, this government is not up to the job of even the small tasks. So how can anyone have faith in their ability to guide us through this project? So my question, will the medical society, with the medical society, raising concerns with the government's own reports flowing, uh, and, and with the government's own reports pointing out flaws, what is the rush? Honorable Premier. Uh, again, Mr. Speaker, I would think that I don't know what the rush is, but I think the determination by UPEI to do this and why we have agreed to support it is because we need to take control of our destiny and try to train uh, and retain doctors here in Prince Edward Island. I mean, that's just a, I, I've said it a, ten times in here. I don't know how we address a labor challenge without addressing labor. And, and we need to, uh, you know, as much as we've worked behind the scenes to help uh, changing with the scopes of practice and, and making it easier for internationally trained physicians and stuff to, uh, to come to our province, there is a shortage of doctors being trained across the country and around the world. And we have an opportunity here to do something really, really important and really, really special. UPEI has worked diligently at this. They're partnering with MUN. It's a very, very unique arrangement working with a school that has done this for decades. And there's a really good opportunity here for islanders island students to participate in the island health care system to relieve some of the pressures that are far too long have dogged our province, Mr. Speaker. Leader, the opposition. Mr. Speaker, my, my concern is this. The government is not up to the job of delivering even the basic um, health care like the CEC in, in, in Western Hospital in Alberton. But the storytelling government is asking onagers to take them seriously when it comes to a multi-million dollar complicated project like the medical school. And so my question is more of a request. Could you not deal with the basics first and do vanity projects after the foundation is repaired? The Honourable Premier. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what the, the, the vanity in it is, uh, Mr. Speaker, that the Honourable Leader of the Opposition refers to. Uh, I think we can all agree, if we don't agree on much in here these days, we can all agree that the health care system is not performing to the needs uh, that Islanders need, want or deserve. Uh, I think we're trying to support an initiative by our university which has 50 years of experience in doing wonderful things to help uh, train and educate our labour force here. Uh, to work uh, in a very unique and collaborative way uh, to help us address the shortage of physicians in this province and to give islanders a chance to participate in the in the health care delivery for their island families and, and friends and neighbors uh, so uh, as I say I, I I wish this would have happened 10 or 15 or 20 years ago uh, but it hasn't uh, we're working very closely with uh, the university. Uh, we know they're working closely with physicians and, and, else, and everyone else within the health care system to try to make sure that this actually becomes a benefit to the system. Uh, we know it won't be easy, but uh, PEI has a great record of doing hard things, Mr. Speaker, and I think this will be one of them. Mr. Speaker, in the last 12 months, we witnessed multiple rounds of corporate greed at Islander's expense. Three electric rates in rate increases, another rate increase before Iraq, possible another rate increase to cover costs of Point Pro, and there's more, another rate increase potential for the installation of smart meters. All of these amount to bailouts on the back of Islanders to cover the cost of Fortis, a multi-billion dollar company. And according to their recent annual report, their revenue last year was up more than three quarters of a billion dollars. Question to the Minister. Why are we even talking about any more rate increases given the amount of obvious resources held by the, this extremely profitable company? The Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So perhaps the member wasn't listening on Friday or didn't watch the news Friday night or read the, the newspaper on Saturday morning, but that's precisely why we are striking a, a group to look at Maritime Electric and see if the ownership is better served belonging with Islanders. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Leader of the Opposition. Um, I listen, there's a lot of wind I listen to too, Mr. Speaker, when I have the window open the vehicle. So, um, we know that Fortis, who owns Maritime Electric, has neglected their duty uh, to the, in regards to vegetation management. So sadly, any windstorm this province encounters leads to power outages, leaving Islanders in the dark because Maritime Electric has failed to trim trees and manage the vegetation along the grid. Now, they are looking for more money. Last time I checked, if you don't do your job, you don't get a raise. And remember, this government doesn't believe in sick time for hard-working islanders, oh, yeah. but are willing to accept a self-written sick notes handed to them by billion-dollar corporations. So, Minister, why don't you tell the multi-billion dollar company they're responsible for vegetation, vegetation management needed to maintain lines, or are you going to give them the raise that they are looking for? <coughs> Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Well, this is borderline silly because we don't give them IRAC decides, which is an independent body. Um, we don't jump in front of IRAC. We create the legislation. The member over there is capable of bringing legislation to the floor, though he never does. Uh, he could bring legislation himself to say those exact things. But what I will say, Mr. Speaker, is we've been going through the legislative process. We're about a year and a half into it. We've uh, been right across the island. Some members in here have attended some of the meetings. Uh, we, we are basically working on what the framework for uh, the, the next 20 years of Prince Edward Island electricity looks like and quite frankly Mr. Speaker that will include who should own uh, Summerside Electric, who should own Maritime Electric and, uh, and how we can best protect, protect the ratepayers and keep the lights on. Thank you Mr. Speaker. Clear the opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I would love to bring uh, some legislation forward, but as we've seen yesterday, legislation that we brought forward to try to increase housing uh, units faster, the majority of the Conservative government, uh, they, they, of course, squash that as they do everything else. So, Mr. Speaker, the Fiona bill of $37 million remains before uh, Iraq, and the Minister is talking about possibly paying the bill with Islanders' money. Now, let's not forget this government somehow failed to recognize in the fall of 2022 that Fortis and its billions in profits does not qualify for small business funding from the federal government. No one should be bailing them out, Mr. Speaker, and in the end, whether the bill is ultimately paid by the taxpayers or ratepayers, this government is content in making sure that Islanders are paying. Islanders are providing the bailout. Fortis wins again. Minister, are you going to tell them we are done bailing out billion dollar companies in this province? Will you tell them that? The Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So there's a lot to unpack there. I guess let's start with the fact that Trudeau lied to us. 
and, uh, and said that he would pay that bill so that we wouldn't have to pay it, so it wouldn't affect the taxpayers of Prince Edward Island, uh, so that it wouldn't have to affect the ratepayers of Prince Edward Island. So, so he lied. So if you're talking about who failed to recognize, it's the guy who lied to our Premier that, that said he'd be good, uh, that he would take care of us when all the lights were out here in Prince Edward Island, when people were struggling to get their power back on, where people were worried in uh, warming shelters, worried when they're going to come back home. So you want to blame somebody, you can blame Trudeau. As far as how we handle Maritime Electric, it's handled legislatively. I've been very, very clear. I don't think I could be any clearer. We intend to look at Maritime Electric and Summerside Electric and see who, belong, who the ownership should belong to to ensure that we do the best by not just the taxpayers of Prince Edward Island, but the ratepayers of Prince Edward Island. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So I'm not sure how a multi-billion dollar company would qualify for small business funding. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, the minister power. continues to claim that he is looking after Islanders, that he doesn't sell the power that Maritime Electric does, that Maritime Electric and Fortis, the multi-billion dollar company, are the problem. Blame them. Minister, you are the regulator. What role are you playing thus far, or is Fortis running the show? Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, we're not the regulator. IRAC is the, the regulator, and I think there's a lot of confusion over there. I'm not sure who, who wrote the questions or if you just picked them out of a Cracker Jack box on your way down from Tignish today, but uh, um, <clears throat> clearly you have zero understanding of how the energy file works here in Prince Edward Island. But what I will say is we intend to bring legislation forward. We've been very clear that we intend to bring legislation forward of what the next 20 to 50 years should look like here in Prince Edward Island as far as electricity, as far as rates, as far as energy production, where production should be held, who should own energy production, how we could be, communities could benefit, how individuals could benefit, how, how we can help reduce rates through time of day, and those types of things, Mr. Speaker. And again, I'll reiterate that we have struck a, uh, a group to, to begin looking at what electricity looks here in Prince Edward Island with both of the main uh, electricity companies here in Prince Edward Island, who should own them, how it should work for taxpayers, and how it should work for ratepayers. And quite frankly, Mr. Speaker, every Islander I've talked to is happy with that, except for him. No, they're not happy with the member for and Vernes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as we've heard some of the uh, responses here today in the legislature, I want to emphasize that it is the Minister of Energy's responsibility to protect Islanders and electric ratepayers, as well as our taxpayers, and to ensure that a utility <laughs> who holds a monopoly treats its customers fairly in the delivery of electricity needs. But what do we see? We just keep here and blame somebody else, talk about something else. Uh, and then the minister here the other day makes this statement, and plus he says he's going to buy uh, Summerside Electric, which is another thing, or find out who owns that. Are you going to expropriate these? What's the plan here in this? Uh, but anyway, question to the Minister of Energy. Uh, would your department have any idea what the profits uh, that Fortis has taken in as it pertains to Maritime Electric in the last 12 months? As we know, Fortis has a $12 billion worth of revenue, and uh, in 2022 it had net earnings of $1.3 billion to its shareholders. The Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There are quite a bit of things uh, said, said there that I'm not sure are 100% true either, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'm not blaming anybody. What, I, what I'm saying is we're, we're taking control of the file. We're taking control of the legislation. We're going to bring legislation forward that, and show Islanders how we view how electricity should work well, well, well into the future and what ownership should look like, what community ownership would look like, how the benefits could stay right in the community. So I've been very clear on that, and I couldn't be any clearer. And I've also been very clear that the, the, the activity that we, we are going out to do to look at the ownership and who should own the, the utility, whether it should be private or whether it should be brought into the, the public domain, is in fact exactly to do what the member's saying I'm not doing. It's to stick up for ratepayers, to stick up for islanders, to help ensure that there, there's a clear future for them where people can afford to keep the electricity on in their home. I can't be any clearer. We are doing 100% sticking up for islanders with the initiatives that we have brought forward. It's too bad for 12 years the honorable member sat over there and said nothing. <laughs> That's a, that's a wonderful rant that the minister puts on there, but I hope this minister actually gave that very same statements to Fortis when he met with them in July 2022. As it appears in social media, he had a meeting with Fortis over in St. John's. Uh, did you represent Islanders like you said you're just doing here right now, or did you ask them, I'll no, just keep the lights on over there, we're not going to worry about what we pay, Islanders are happy uh, just with whatever you give us? Tell us a little bit about what you said to the members in, at Fortis, the executive directors. 
climate action. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So I met with the, the Vice President of Forest, and I told the media here, here on Friday, I didn't make any of the stories, that I intend to meet them again this summer when I'm in St. John's for the, or the Environment Minister's meetings in July. Uh, to, have, to have a frank discussion about the future of Maritime Electric and where we view it in the province. But what I will say at the time, when we, were, when we sat down, at the time what we were trying to do was get them to move towards some of the models that we were saying when we were saying we want to move towards distributed energy. We want to do a study on community owned energy where the community could, could benefit. Um, we, the, the Georgetown project that's now being undertaken by UPEI was one of the projects that we talked about. Would you partner on that? Would you come on board? Will you allow it to happen without us having to go through a legislative change to make you allow it to happen? So those, that was the crux of the conversation we had that time, is how could we move forward the initiatives of government that we had clearly stated that we want to be our initiatives without being encumbered by Maritime Electric or without being told by Maritime Electric that it can't happen or that it won't work because we knew it worked in everywhere else in the world and we want to prove it here in Prince of Island. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So as was mentioned yesterday on CBC, we heard that the Medical Society of PEI very, care very thoughtfully laid out why the medical school may be a good idea, but now simply isn't the right time to pursue it. It's, they say that the only responsible next step is to press pause until we know we are in a position to staff it without hurting our already strained system. MC MSPEI, which represents 400 doctors, is the latest group to express concerns, joining senior civil servants, independent consultants, and engaged islanders who are all very worried that PEI continues to bulldoze ahead to create a new medical school at a time when the health system is unraveling. To the Premier, who should islanders trust when it comes to the medical school? Their doctors or the Premier? The Honourable Premier. Uh, that's a, a very good question. I, I hope uh, we can trust both. Um, because we're going to need everybody and more working together to, to make it successful, which I do believe in my heart everybody within this legislature wants to see it successful. I believe that. Um, again, as I say, I, I respect very much uh, uh, Dr. Castle. I respect very much the members of the Medical Society of PEI. I thank them uh, for their work. I work closely with them. Uh, every day in this job, and I want to continue to do that. I know UPEI is doing that as well. Again, I would ask the, the question, uh, uh, what would the pause get us? In t with, the, with the situation that we find ourselves in, uh, it's as if we're waiting for something magical to happen so that we could uh, do this, I guess, easier or, or more efficiently, whatever those exact words are. So, uh, again, um, I think that this will end up being a very, very net, net, net positive for the healthcare system in Prince Edward Island. It will give Islanders a chance to participate in the delivery of healthcare. Uh, I do agree with those who say it should have happened a long, long time ago, uh, and I wish it would have, but uh, I can only deal in the here and now, and that's the path that we're supporting UPEI on at this time, Mr. Speaker. Leader of the third party. Speaker. Yes, this should have happened a long, long time ago, but it hasn't. And the only way to show, truly show respect and thanks to healthcare professionals is by listening to them. That is the only way. Last week in this House, the Premier said that the thing that carried the most weight for him pushing ahead with the school, despite so much concern from the experts, was the statistic on the number of island students who get accepted to medical school. He has often stated that only 1 in 11 students who apply for medical schools get accepted, compared to 1 in 2 in Newfoundland and Labrador, and that this inequity is his primary reason for pressing ahead. I can't find any evidence for this claim. If the Premier has this convincing evidence, will he table it in this House tomorrow? Uh, I think, uh, sure, I'd be happy to table all of that uh, that we can. Uh, again, I, I think that example comes from uh, 44 students from PEI applied to uh, MUN, uh, Memorial University Medical School, uh, and four got in. Uh, so that would be a simple one in 11, for example, uh, with that school. There are very, very limited seats for out of, yeah, but when you talk about Dal and Sherbrooke, the out of province seats that are available are very, very minuscule. Uh, and that's why we need to create more opportunities for island students. Uh, and I think what we're seeing uh, through this is that uh, UPEI uh, has, uh, has initially uh, 
wanted to make those seats available for Islanders because we think it would be the best opportunity to train and to retain those physicians in Prince Edward Island. Uh, they're badly, badly needed. Uh, and I think it's, uh, it's one of these, as I said in the State of the Province address, that uh, these are some of the issues in the changing world with protectionism being what it is in between not just countries but provinces, that we need to take a little greater control of our own destiny here. And uh, that's what we're trying to do, Mr. Speaker. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. One cohort in one year in one school, that's what we're basing our decision on a medical school for? God, if that's our math, we're in trouble. Unlike the UPEI Medical School, which will see physicians fully trained by 2032 at the earliest, medical students in other countries could be fully trained in two years, which is 2026, if we made more residency seats available. Yeah, this is considerably less expensive, less risky, and would deliver quicker health care benefits for Islanders as we perhaps figure out a medical school. To the Premier, why are you so focused on gambling on a medical school when you could focus on policy measures that ex experts actually support right now. Well, I guess the question I would ask in response to that, if we could make room to train people from all over the world, why can't we make room to train them right here from Prince Edward Island? Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There's been much talk in this chamber and outside about the ongoing deterioration of services at the Prince County Hospital. The two recent public meetings at Credit Union Place drew large and passionate crowds uh, with much to say on the issue and they expressed some real deep-seated fears about the future of that hospital, which I would point out serves not only Summerside but my district of Borden Concora as well as West Prince and other uh, regions here in this province. In response, government came up with the idea of an emergency operations committee regarding critical care at the Prince County Hospital. However, and somewhat unbelievably, I have been told there are no medical staff from the Prince County Hospital on this committee, even though they are the experts on the ground at the PCH. Question to the Minister of Health, Mr. Speaker. Can the Minister explain why there are no Prince County Hospital medical staff on this important committee that is designed to save critical care at the Prince County Hospital? Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I do agree uh, physician engagement is important at the PCH, and we continue to do that. I know actually um, we're going to, we, from a recruitment perspective, we actually are bringing a physician leader with us uh, to Dalhousie in March to attend internal medicine recruitment uh, activity, so it's good to have their partnership in, in our efforts to recruit to that hospital. And again, the OCS is an important part of, of, of us reestablishing services. Again, um, labor is that key part. We want to be able to operate PCH so safely um, for both the physicians, the staff, and the patients. We are asking a lot of those physicians um, that have maintained that service for a long time for us, and it's really hard on them. You can see it uh, when you talk to them how difficult it's been, and so we want to support them as much as we can. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Borden Kinkora. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I believe that, in a roundabout way, sort of answers the question uh, <laughs> in that there is, in fact, no uh, physicians or medical staff from the uh, Prince County Hospital on this emergency operations committee which is designed to save the Prince County Hospital uh, and I would note out that this includes none of the 42 doctors who wrote the jointly signed letter that was the catalyst to this whole public outcry in the first place. So I'm going to ask the same, the same minister a very similar question. If you would correct the situation immediately and ensure that voices from the Prince County Hospital are represented on this committee, the very committee that is tasked with saving the hospital that so many Islanders are working hard to save. Mr. Speaker, and again, um, we do uh, We are uh, talking with our physician um, leaders at that at, at that facility. We do need an administrator at that facility for sure. We know that it's a gap, and again, we're we've engaged a firm in order to have uh, an administrator there uh, to represent PCH. I think that is part of the issue that we need to um, uh, improve at that facility is to have. Uh, a permanent administrator position uh, in that in that role uh, to represent the hospital. So again, uh, we're doing everything we can. It's a daily um, meeting, I think, uh, to to maintain those services and try to grow them. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Boring Kinkora. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I understand that the uh, doctors and the critical care staff at the Prince County Hospital have asked twice 
of this government for representation on this committee, and they have not had a response from anyone, uh, which does seem to be consistent, uh, unfortunately, in the health care approach. Um, other than a suggestion, I believe there's a suggestion that they start their own mini emergency operations committee, uh, separate and apart from the real emergency operations committee. I guess my question to the minister, uh, Mr. Speaker, would be that if the real emergency operations committee cannot be started immediately in the hope of saving the Prince County Hospital critical care unit, will you turn it over to the Prince County Hospital so they can take the lead on it and get things moving? Uh, thank you, um, and we do have Dr. Uh, Martha uh, Carmichael involved in uh, in the C C chief medical uh, officer role uh, that's involved in those meetings. I know that for sure. Um, again, I think it is important to engage our physician community, and I'm sure that's uh, that's happening at that facility. Um, if it's not, again, that's something I would not be aware of, so I'm not sure about your claims about that they haven't been asked, so on and so forth. I, I can't verify or deny um, those requests, um, again, but uh, I appreciate um, the intensity of, of what we want to accomplish at the PCH. We want it as bad as, as the physicians do at that facility. Um, and again, they've done a lot for us, not only the physicians, all the staff there is to maintain that unit as best they can under very trying circumstances. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Rustico Emerald. Mr. Speaker, our tourism operators bring in a whopping $85 million in tax revenue. However, the tourism PEI budget of $30 million includes $17 million per provincial golf courses, and the Department of Tourism collects $10 million in revenue. So really, the general tourism PEI budget is a measly $3 million, or just 3.5% of the taxes our tourism operators generate. That's about the same as the credit card fees they pay, Mr. Speaker. When a single deal with the NHL increases the tourism PEI marketing budget by almost 50%, it's crystal clear how little is being spent on the critical tourism industry by government. Question to the Minister of Finance. Why does the province of PEI spend so little to support our tourism operators and our tourism industry? Whoa. The Minister of Finance. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, you know, uh, the Department of Tourism would put forward their priorities for the year. Um, they would put forward their priorities and what their spends are for the year, and we would take a look at that and, um, and decide, um, you know, um, whether that's a good spend or not. And, um, but really, truly, uh, the Department would put forward their numbers, and, um, you know, they put forward a solid plan this year um, with some new initiatives in there that I think supports tourism industry and PEI, um, and we'll continue to do that moving forward. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, our tourism operators collect HST on behalf of government. When the customer pays by credit card, the business must pay credit card fees on that HST, anywhere from 1.5% to 3.5% per transaction. As more and more consumers use credit cards, the processor fees for collecting HST add up, adding up to hundreds of thousands in new costs for these businesses, all in service of government. Before the HST was harmonized over a decade ago, island businesses could get rebates on the credit card processing fees. Those were replaced with input tax credits that don't capture all of the extra costs incurred. Question to the Finance Minister. Has government ever looked at adjusting these tax credits to help address the surge in credit card processing fees businesses are being forced to swallow. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, this is something that I know came to caucus um, with a presentation through Restaurants Canada, and I think it, um, I was sorry I missed it. Um, I had a conflict, but I got the briefing on it, and uh, this is kind of new information to me right now as I sit here, so I will take it back and take a look and see if we can do some analysis on that. The member for Rustico Emerald. Uh, so, Mr. Speaker, restaurants and other food service businesses are unique because they incur all the costs other businesses do, but they can't fully claim all the credits because food makes up so much of their expenses. Mr. Speaker, we have a thriving restaurant sector in the province that contributes massively to our economy. The restaurant sector generates over $175 million on credit card sales and almost $20 million in provincial sales tax. Question to the Finance Minister. Would you commit to having government implement a rebate on the credit card processing fees paid to collect the provincial portion of the HST? Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely commit to take this back and take a look at it and do some analysis. I mean, 
um, I think it's critical that we do support our businesses. And this just isn't restaurants and tourism. This, quite frankly, probably is all businesses that have to deal with this. So this is certainly something we can take a look at and, um, and come back with um, some options. Thanks. The member for Summerside, Wilmot. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the residents of Summerside and Prince County and all the islands should, should have a big sigh of relief today because we've seen at the start of question period that the uh, opposition's finally going to take health care serious and forget about the sub pumps and card tables the last week. Uh, last week I asked the Minister of Health some questions on the Prince County Hospital that came from a town hall meeting that I had and we had some satisfactory answers, Mr. Speaker, but the jury's still out on a lot of them answers. So we often hear about the time it takes to fill a position and vacancies at the Prince County Hospital and about the lengthy steps in the process. So a question to the Minister of Health, can you walk us through the, all the steps that need to happen to fill vacancies from posting a job to a successful candidate in place? Uh, thank the Honourable uh, Member for the Minister question. Of Health and Wellness. Again, we do have processes in place. We have actually had meetings with the Department of Health, PEI and PSE to look at all those processes that we do. I call it the pipelining um, kind of meetings to ensure that uh, the pipeline is, is as efficient as possible. I know the PSC has made some investments in hiring uh, to bring down some of their turnaround times. Again, we always have to... Um, look at classification and how those uh, positions uh, reflect union and collective agreements too so that they're, they're in sync as well. So um, the PSC has made improvements in, in, in turnaround times with, with increased volumes. I do know that from, from the briefing. Uh, maybe the Minister could talk a little bit more about that, but I don't mind sharing the, that data with the Honourable Member or with this House that they have made uh, efficiency improvements at, at the PSC. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Member for Summerside, Wilmot. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I gather from that that it's probably a lot of steps. I know that uh, in speaking with the minister, he often, he'll often have numbers and all that, and I appreciate that. But we also hear that we lose a lot of our health care professionals in neighboring provinces because they don't have as many steps in filling these positions. And in turn, that leaves the residents unhappy, which leaves me unhappy, Minister. So do you know... The, does the Minister of Health know, is there more or less steps, or what are the steps in filling positions in our neighbouring provinces? The uh, Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Member, for the question. I guess if I compare this to some of our largest uh, um, provinces, some of them have as many as 100 health authorities, so again, the complexity uh, of those provinces I really couldn't comment on. I guess we have to be focused on what we're doing here. Um, I know the Honourable Member from Tyne Valley asked me about locum contracts so on for, uh, the other day and I didn't give a great answer so I did look into it. We have put uh, an online system in fall this year. Uh, we call for appointment and privileging so again it saves the data. Now that we have the Atlantic Reg Registry I think there's some conversations going on that that um, I think they call it current uh, CMAS system will be shared amongst the provinces to allow greater mobility. So I think that's another improvement that we've worked with our other provinces to allow uh, physicians to specifically to apply for positions uh, faster. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Do you remember for Summerside, Wilmot? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think that the number of steps, hurdles, red tape involved in the hiring process is probably a bigger part of the problem than realized. We often hear from different people around the communities and in the healthcare positions to take politics out of the process. And recently, I asked at one vested group, how would they do this? And they frankly put it, remove some of the steps. So, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Health and Wellness again. How can we streamline the steps in the hiring process to be more competitive? And what are we doing to achieve this? The Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you all for the questions. So, some good questions today. I do know for external postings, we have removed the end date, so they do stay up uh, in perpetuity. Uh, they used to have a, a start and an end date for posting, so I know we've removed that. We've also created the nursing portal as well, which has been very effective, is that uh, nurses don't have to apply for a specific position specifically. They can apply to the portal, and then we sit down with them and match skill sets. So I think that's another improvement. 
Um, I know for uh, grads uh, in the nursing program, if they have done their, some of their clinical work um, within Health PEI, we we're going to bypass the interview process uh, and the job offer process. So that's a few things that we've done. Is there more work to be done? No doubt. Obviously, we always have to work uh, in conjunction with our unions and colleges to ensure that we check all the boxes. So we'll continue to do that. So thank you for the question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For the next question, I'll remember uh, Rule 64, uh, questions requiring a lengthy reply, where in the opinion of the Speaker, a question put to a minister is of such a nature as to require a lengthy reply, such as you know, the number of steps you have outlined. Uh, the Speaker may, upon the request of a minister, direct the question to be put in writing or to stand as notice and be transferred to the order paper. So if there's a minister that receives a question that feels it needs a much more lengthy response than is allowed in question period, you are allowed to request that. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition, final question. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So we all know now that the Premier made the trek to Boston in January 2023 to watch the NHL's Winter Classic game. Yeah. And we know that the justification for this trip was the host discussions with NHL representatives about the marketing opportunities that were announced recently. So question to the Premier. If this trip was part of the announcement that your government made with such fanfare, why were the expenses for this New Year's Day road trip to Boston hidden and not filed until April, several weeks after the 2023 provincial ex uh, election? The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, that I do not know. Um, I file my quarterly reports um, as I'm legislatively obligated to do. Uh, in partnership with my uh, admin uh, people. It's signed off by uh, the Chief of Staff. Um, I suppose we probably weren't in the office because we had called the election in March, would be my guess, but I, I need to verify with my admin assistant to verify. Mr. Speaker. End of question period. Statements by ministers. We'll start with the uh, Minister of Education in early years, the minister responsible for the status of women. Mr. Speaker, I have the tremendous honour today to introduce to the Legislative Assembly the 2024 Easter Seals Ambassador, Lucie Gallon. Lucie is 10 years old and a Grade 5 student at École sur Mer in Summerside. Joining her on her ambassador journey are her parents, Melissa and Chris, and her younger brother, Jackson, who isn't with us here today. He's probably in school, yes. Lucy is the first ever Francophone ambassador for PEI Easter Seals. J'ai rencontré Lucy lors d'une célébration de timbre de Pâques à l'automne, et je sais que représenter la communauté francophone sera un véritable honneur pour Lucy et sa famille. En dehors de l'école, Lucy aime le basketball, la natation, l'art, faire des vidéos et passer du temps avec des animaux, en particulier des chevaux et les chats. Lucy's motto throughout her Easter Seals journey is, with a positive mind, you can do extraordinary things. And Lucy, I am confident you will do extraordinary things with this year. Le des temps forts de chaque année est bien sûr la tournée des écoles du Temple de Pâques. Cette année, la tournée se déroulera sur une période de deux semaines <coughs> du 24 au 30 avril. Comme toujours, je tiens à remercier D.M. Murphy et Tim Hortons pour le par parrainage et la tournée de des écoles. J'ai hâte de rejoindre Lucy et sa famille tout au long de la tournée lorsque nous visiterons des écoles dans toute la province. Mr. Speaker, I also want to recognize the hard work and dedication of our school communities and all the outstanding fundraisers that happen within our schools to raise money for Easter Seals. And this year, I want to provide an extra incentive, a little extra challenge to help motivate our students. This school, the school that raises the most money this year for Easter Seals, whether it's through PJ Days, bake sales, pledge forms, or whatever creative fundraising ideas schools come up with, the school that raises the most money per student will win a school-wide pizza party from the Department of Education and Early Years. We know this will be... <laughs> You're a 
amazing, Lucy. You're, yeah, you're amazing. And everybody loves pizza, right? Yes. Yeah. We know that this will be another exciting year as we work together to increase awareness and meet fundraising goals on behalf of people across Prince Edward Island living with disabilities. Mr. Speaker, I also want to recognize an important person who is joining Lucy and her family here today, Miss Helen Chapman. Helen recently took on the role as the Executive Director of Easter Seals PEI after a very successful career with the QEH Foundation. I want to wish Helen all the very best in your new position. Thank you for coming out of your retirement and into this new challenge. We are so thankful to have you leading the Easter Seals program here on Prince Edward Island. Merci. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Charlottetown West Royalty. Yes, well, I, I don't know how to follow that, Minister. Great, <laughs> great job. Um, uh, Offer more pizza. Yes, well, <laughs> uh, I can tell you, uh, for that expense, you'll get no opposition from this side of the house. So. Um, thank you for joining us, Lucy. Um, uh, it's uh, congratulations on being the ambassador for this year, and uh, to your to your mom and dad, Melissa and Chris. Thank you for being here, and, and Alan, too, for your role. Uh, merci beaucoup. La chose que tu vas faire, c'est très important. Uh, J'aime le fait que tu, que tu joues le basket, le basketball, c'est bon. Et um, uh, je vous souhaite un une bon uh, bonne mois d'avril. Et merci encore pour tout ce que tu fais, c'est très, très important. Thank you, Lucy. Thanks. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I would agree. There's not much to add to what the minister just announced. What a, what a fun time, and, and really a genuine thank you for coming in today. Et c'est tellement excitant, la première ambassadrice France, francophone. Alors, félicitations. Ça, c'est vraiment excitant. And uh, as I, as I uh, mentioned before, welcome to, to her team who's here, her family, and, and Helen Chapman as well. You form a very important part of the team. And uh, to keep to keep Lucy fueled and going, although it could be the other way around. Um, and and how exciting the pizza party! I mean, it's exciting enough when there's a class pizza party, but when it's a school-wide pizza party, that's whole new level. So um, I just want to wish you the best time on touring around the island. I know that I, I used to be a teacher, and so that was always one of the most fun times of the year was when we would all gather in the school gym, and and the Easter Seals ambassador would come visit us, and the energy in the gyms is palpable so um, and I'm sure that you'll bring that energy too so have lots of fun and uh, best of luck to you thank you mr. speaker the uh, Minister of Social Development and seniors thank you mr. speaker we all know whether through our own experience or perhaps more recently through raising our children that the transition to adulthood can be tough this transition is more challenging today than ever before. Going from youth to adult comes with both opportunities and challenges that can have a lasting impact over the course of our lives. It is difficult enough to navigate this time with a full support system. And for many youth who are in care of the Director of Child Protection, that support system is challenging. That is why our department has launched the Youth Extended Service Program, also known as the YES Program. The goal of the YES Program is to help youth develop core skills, build a network of support, and to ensure that each youth has, all of us, has what all of us need to live our lives securely, that it, <clears throat> that it is home. Oh, that is, people to help us and people who can trust. We can trust when we need help. The YES program is based on theories of positive youth development, harm reduction, experimental learning, and trauma-informed care. Youth are supported by dedicated YES coaches. The coach's role is to help youth in care to be as prepared as possible for the challenges and the opportunities they may face as they move into adulthood. 
Some examples of supports offered in the YES program include <coughs> conflict resolu resolution, supports for employment, housing, education, interpersonal skills, and many more. The YES program formally began in late January of this year <coughs> with two coaches currently serving about 20 youth who are in care or in extended services. With the new with the new Child, Youth and Family Service Act, this support will now be available for youth up to the age of 25 years, which is up from age 21. The Youth Extended Services coaches are committed to working with youth in care to provide individualized supports. These young people have told us what they want. They want meaningful involvement in the, in the decisions made about them better access to programs, a strong connection to supportive adults, and to have a voice and a choice in all that impacts, impacts their present and their future. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and um, it's a welcoming announcement today. I just hope that um, this is offered and available to um, youth right across the island not just uh, in, in certain areas of Prince Edward Island, so that all, all youth, whether it's from the western uh, end of the island or down on the eastern end, that they have access uh, to, these, uh, to this program, to these YES coaches who, are, who, who play a critical role in addressing some of the issues that our youth are facing right now. But really, I mean, you know, they do need some help with, with housing, with uh, employment, et cetera. But at the end of the day, they just re sometimes just need somebody that they can trust and talk to. So I certainly hope, and I'm sure these coaches um, would provide that. Um, I, I would definitely hope so. Um, so with that, I, uh, you know, I, I want to see more about this program, though. I want to see, I want to know more about this program, and I want to know exactly where these services will be offered. Because, like I said from the start, all island youth should have that opportunity to participate, and uh, because the. Uh, guidance that we can provide, as, as in the Yes Councillors or the program or as the government, uh, to our youth today will certainly help us in the future. Thank you. Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister. What a, what a wonderful announcement. This is something that um, on the occasions that I've had to speak with the Child and Youth, um, this is a long title, so Advisory Committee of the PEI Child, PEI Child and Youth Advocate. This was something that they had identified as a, a huge gap for them, um, and that was when the age was only 21, and they were also advocating for that to be 25. So there's kind of a double, a double thing in there, not that that's new, but, but it is fairly new. Um, and so I think that this is really exciting because one of the things that they had identified is that they did have trouble because they didn't have some of those core basic skills that, that some of us who, who may have um, grown up with doing those things, a lot of our youth in, in care, children in care, don't get that opportunity and that support network. Those two things are so crucial and it, I just think that, you know, that gives, that gives youth in care such a, um, an opportunity um, to have that. And so, so I look forward to seeing how that evolves. Um, and another thing that we had heard from the Child and Youth Advisory Committee, and I think this plays into it a little bit, and, and something that I look forward to discussing in, in the budget perhaps, is um, they had talked about getting some of these skills while they were still in um, under the age of 25, but as they were growing up, you know, have more of an opportunity to cook their own foods and do the grocery shopping and, and have more responsibility there. So I think that's something that, you know, we can add on. Um, and so I want to thank the Minister for that announcement and I look forward to hearing more about it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the provincial budget focuses on our highest priorities to help improve the quality of life for all Islanders. Supporting Islanders' connection to vital public supports and services is a key part of my department. Through Access PEI, residents receive high quality and efficient service at nine locations throughout the province. I want to recognize the dedicated and hardworking staff at all of the centres who are focused on helping Islanders connect with services in the programs they need. In fact, Mr. Speaker, there are over 430 
different services available to Islanders that access PEI, and I will be tabling with uh, this uh, ministerial statement uh, the 430 plus services that are offered. Some of these important services, though, just to highlight a few, include applications for free heat pumps, driver's licenses, building permits, health care cards. Today, more people are turning to access PEI than ever before. An additional 20,000 people visited access PEI sites in 2023 compared to 2022. In 2023, Personal appointments for some services began, and 3,800 Islanders took up this opportunity for in-person appointments. And last fall, we announced the location of a new access PEI center in Cornwall to offer government services closer to residents in Cornwall and other communities nearby. While our government service is adapting to the changing and growing population, there is always the opportunity to ex examine operations to enhance service and build on success. Over the next several months, there will be a comprehensive review of all access PEI locations and infrastructure. People using access PEI will be asked for their input and our staff will be engaged. Access PEI wants to know such things as what do you or what do Islanders accessing services need? How can services be more user-friendly and accessible? These are some of the questions that will be explored as staff enhance service delivery at Access PEI to make sure that the needs of our growing and changing population are being met. Mr. Speaker, I am looking forward to learning more about the results of the review as well as feedback received from Islanders and staff. Collaboration will help to make sure Access PEI is providing the right services at the right time in the very best possible way. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I don't know how many times I've stood in this House and, and said how important Access PEI locations uh, across Prince Edward Island are how important they are to, to Islanders. Uh, the Minister mentioned that it's, it's, it's vital public support and it really, really is, especially in my area, because uh, I see it firsthand uh, over, over the years. And being one of the extremities from the base of government here in Charlottetown, they, everybody goes there for direction, for uh, whatever support they possibly can. And I can tell you that those who are employed at the Access PEI location, in Tignish in particular, um, Krista Goody, who's been there for years, and, and recently addition, uh, the addition of Carol Ann Barber, bring a lot of uh, a personality to their positions too, and are very friendly and welcoming, and that makes a difference in our community, when, especially when seniors or, or those who may have special needs um, feel comfortable going in there to ask for uh, ask questions or ask for directions, and they certainly make people uh, feel, feel, feel very, very welcome, and, and I do appreciate that. Um, you mentioned there was 430 plus services that are provided at, at the nine access centers across Prince Edward Island, uh, 430 plus, and then we can add on to that being a, a, a tourist information center, because uh, <laughs> many tourists drop in to access PEI to try to find out local uh, tourist um, places to go to, Stomp and Tom, they all want to find out how do we get to Stomp and Tom. Yeah, and uh, the Orthopedia Museum in O'Leary is another good spot too. So access PEI is just more than just providing the, uh, uh, direction and, and support for government services. They are part of a, of a community and they're very, very important. So I hope this review, um, Absolutely, the review doesn't take away any of these centres that are in existence on Prince of Red Island presently, and I do uh, encourage all Islanders to engage in the review process, and I look forward to seeing what the review uh, comes up with. Thank you. Uh, the member for New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I welcome this announcement from the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure, and uh, 
when we first moved to PEI, I spent a lot of time in access PEI centers picking up the various cards and things that you need to have. And I was super impressed by how smoothly and how efficiently it happened and how friendly the staff were. And, and to this day, I, I, that's been my experience. I mean, these days you can do so much of the uh, pers in, in person stuff that 25 years ago you had no choice on online and um, that's how I do most of my access PEI stuff these days and, and folks that I speak to but um, quite astonishing that over 430 services I would never have guessed that it was that many and that really tells you the range of um, the range of stuff that's available for Islanders uh, at, at these access PEI centres and uh, I'm looking forward to the one opening in Cornwall selfishly because uh, many of my constituents in District 17, New Haven, Rocky Point, um, were exactly halfway between Summerside and Charlottetown. So it's a long drive either way. So having an access PEI centre in Cornwall is, is going to be great. And I, I look forward to that opening whenever that's, that's going to be. Uh, I'm, I'm also very happy to hear that you are going to interview the frontline staff at, at uh, Access PEI to get some direction or some feedback from them and, and I think there are other departments in government who would benefit from speaking to their frontline front line staff as, as, uh, as closely as you, you clearly are going to in this, in this uh, review and I too would encourage all islanders to get involved but I have to tell you my experience at uh, Access PEI centres has been nothing but positive. You talked about enhancing the service there and the only thing I would suggest you could do that would entice me to come into access PEI service centres more often is if you were to offer a latte. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Pre presenting and receiving petitions. Tabling of documents. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. By leave of the House, I beg leave the table. A CBC article dated March the 5th regarding uh, comments by a group representing 400 island physicians who have not been widely consulted or, or heard uh, that are recommending a pause on the medical school. And I move second by the member from Charlottetown, West Royals, that said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shall I carry? Yeah, carry. Okay. The member for O'Leary and Burness. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, by leave of this House, I beg leave to table a tweet by Fortis identifying its meeting with Minister of Energy of PEI on July 22nd. I move seconded by the Leader of the Opposition that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shall I carry? Uh, the Minister of Economic Development, Innovation and Trade. Mr. Speaker, by leave of this House, I beg to leave through table the report Startup Ecosystem Review and Action Plan commissioned from Innovation PI and discussed in estimates yesterday. And I move, seconded by the Minister of Finance, that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shall I carry? Sure. Minister of uh, Transportation and Infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, by leave of the House, I beg leave to table of the over 430 services and programs that are available to Islanders at Access PEI locations across the province. And I move seconded by the Honourable Minister of uh, Economic Development and Tourism that the said documents now be received in July on the table. Shall I carry? Uh, reports by committees. Introduction of government bills. Motions other than government. The uh, member for Charlton West Royalty. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. This time I call motion number 61. Back. Shall I carry? Carry. Motion 61, Commission on Population, has been read. Debate was adjourned by the mover, the Honorable Leader of the Official Opposition, to close debate. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So I'll be very brief in closing. I want to begin by thanking those who took uh, this opportunity to, uh, to respond to this motion. I know the, uh, it was seconded by the member from Charlottetown West Royalty, the, the leader of the third party spoke on it, the Minister of Workforce Advanced Learning and Population spoke on it, and the uh, Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action spoke on it, who gave us a history, uh, but didn't provide any, any path forward. Um, 
But I will, I will mention that what he did mention, he did talk about, and, he, and, and it's part of this was immigration, immigration, immigration. And immigration began in Canada in 1998. And at that time, the premier of Prince Edward Island was Pat Binns. Uh, so for, from that time up until 2007, for nine years, there was a feeding frenzy at the trough of many uh, conservatives on Prince Edward Island in the PNP program. Um, so one cannot blame any particular party or anything whenever, at that time, uh, I guess sometimes you have your blinders on and you only see what you want to see, Mr. Speaker. So anyway, that's just a little bit of uh, an addition to uh, the history lesson that was uh, given us, uh, to us yesterday. So um, what we're asking for with the population is a, is a target uh, immigration to our, our labour gaps here in Prince Edward Island. And with the increase in our population, and we need that population, it's been mentioned, uh, myself and others, uh, we need that to keep our economy going in so many of the different uh, sectors, but the government needs to put a concrete action plan forward and how they're going to address this and not just throw a number out that they're going to decrease about this number but not have any any reason as to why they, they selected that particular number or what the outcome might be uh, down the road. So we're looking at reaching 200,000 people by 2032 um, and then even moving forward past that, what is this government doing for infrastructure in Prince Edward Island for the potential of it reaching 250,000 by the way it's, it's rapidly increasing at the present moment. But back to immigration, I mean, there's a whole suite at the federal level of immigration programs. Uh, the province can pick and choose whatever programs that they require or, 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 or want. It's just the same as going into a restaurant. They hand you a menu. You're not obligated to pick everything out of the menu. You pick out of the menu what you want. So the government needs to really have a serious look at to what programs they are selecting on Prince Edward Island and target the immigration towards construction, <laughs> towards uh, health care in particular, because, as stated, less than 1% of both of those Came in, came in through immigration. For one, less than 1% was nursing, less than 1% of immigration uh, came into Prince Edward Island for construction. And we have a housing crisis and a health care crisis at the present time that needs to be addressed. So what I'm asking for in this uh, motion was that the province consider creating a commission of population under the authority of the Public Inquiries Act and that the mandate for this commission include an examination of this province's services and infrastructure in the event of a population that reaches 250,000 in the foreseeable future, and that a, the commission complete its report within 12-month 12, 12 period uh, and, and report accordingly to the Legislative Assembly. So that's what our ask is. Islanders deserve to know that there is uh, work being done to help us in this crisis and that immigration will be targeted primarily towards uh, the labour gaps that we presently have here in Prince Edward Island. So uh, Mr. Speaker, I'll end with that and I will ask all members of this House, because we hear it every day from our constituents of what can, what can we do to change, what can we do to uh, get us out of these crises, um, and this is just another tool that the government can use to help um, give them some direction um, to help us in these, this crisis situation we are, and hopefully they will support this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Member. <coughs> all right, Members, we're voting on uh, Motion uh, 61. All those voting against the motion, please say nay. Nay. All those voting... Uh, Sir James, you please ring the bell. Thank you.
for the vote. Thank you. Government's ready for the vote, Mr. Speaker. Okay, honorable members, all those voting against motion 61, please rise. The Minister of Education and Early Years and the Minister responsible for the status of women. The Minister of Finance. The Minister of Agriculture, Justice and Public Safety, the Attorney General and Deputy Premier. The Member for Kensington Maltech. The Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. The Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. The Member for Charlottetown Winslow. The Minister of Fisheries, Tourism, Sport and Culture. The Minister of Workforce, Advanced Learning and Population. The Minister of Social Development and Seniors. The Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. The Minister of Economic Development, Innovation and Trade. The Minister of Health and Wellness. The Member for Rustico Emerald. The member for Surrey Almira. The member for <coughs> Summerside Wilmot. The member for Tyne Valley Sherbrooke. And the member for Charlottetown Belvedere. All those voting in favor of the motion, please rise. The member for Borden Kinkora, the leader of the third party. The member for Charlottetown West Royalty, the leader of the official opposition. The member for New Haven, Rocky Point, and the member for O'Leary and Burness. Honourable members, the motion has been defeated. Uh, Charlottetown West Royalty. Um, at this time, I call motion number 62 to the floor. Shall I carry? Carry. carry. <coughs> motion 62. The member for Charlottetown West Royalty moves, seconded by the leader of the official opposition, the following motion. Whereas it is essential to increase the hours of operations at shelters in Prince Edward Island to ensure they meet the needs of the unhoused community. And whereas ensuring access to shelter services is crucial to protect the vulnerable members of our island. And whereas 24 hour shelter availability is a critical component to addressing homelessness, providing security, and enabling individuals to rebuild their lives. Therefore, be it resolved that the Legislative Assembly calls upon the government to conduct an independent, thorough, and transparent review of all shelter services in Prince Edward Island. Therefore, be it further resolved that the government is urged to assess the quality, accessibility, and overall effectiveness of current shelter services with the aim of identifying areas for improvement. And therefore, be it further resolved that the Legislative Assembly urges government to give consideration to allocating the necessary resources for fu and funding for the immediate implementation of 24-hour shelter services. And therefore, be it further resolved that the government is encouraged to engage with local shelters, experts, and stakeholders to ensure the review process and the subsequent implementation of 24-hour shelter services are informed by the best practices and meet the specific needs of our community. And therefore, be it further resolved that the government give consideration to providing a progress report to the public within 30, day, 30 days detailing the steps taken to open shelter locations 24 hours a day. We're calling the uh, member from Charlottetown West Royalty to open debate. Um, may I have the speaker, please? Our speaker. Podium, please. You got him. <laughs> Whether you want him or not. <laughs> I don't know anymore. <laughs> Pleasure to rise and uh, talk about to this important motion number 62, and it's it's very simple in nature when you're looking at it from the outside. But when you're looking at it from the inside and and being the critic for many years of of housing in this file, I see a, a complete lack of willingness to do the simplest things and opening island shelters for 24 hours a day is one of the simplest things that this government should have done, has no plans to do, and will do anything, it seems, will do anything outside of opening up shelters. I don't know what the problem is. I have no idea why it's so difficult for you to, to do 
the little things that matter the most for people. And if you're talking to people that struggle to find housing, this problem is getting worse. And people are falling into poverty. When we have strict deadlines, when we have strict legislation in place to reduce poverty within the year, and it's going the wrong way. And when people fall into poverty and they don't have a place to live, the fear of being on the streets, and the streets in, in Prince Edward Island are very difficult, and we see it happen. People fall into not only poverty, but then they fall into alcohol use, they fall into drug use, and they can't escape it because it's everywhere. And they need a place of respite. They need a place to get away. When you look at something as simple as just asked a few questions on Deacon House and how you're going to improve Deacon House, which was by the hospital outside of, uh, outside of uh, the beaten path, and a place where people could go that was run by Health PEI to provide them services, this, what does this government do? They shut it down. They shut it down and they move it from Health PEI over to social development. Social development buys a building on Houston Street and they make Smith Lodge and then they put in Deacon House into Smith Lodge and what do they do then? They change the name of Deacon House and then what do they do then? They shut it down because yeah. they opened up a 48 unit shelter um, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a Park Street. That's the path of Deacon House. That's what you did, but I saw it all, I saw it every single time. So we've lost those beds. We've lost that respite. It wasn't managed properly, and now it's gone. I know what you're going to say. We have improved uh, Smith Lodge, and we've increased the beds uh, at Smith Lodge. You have it because the announcement from a former minister was a 28 bed. This province bought a 28 bed facility, and we were going to change everything. Guess what? For a large period of time, it opened up at how many beds? Nine. Nine beds. You're not even using the full capacity. I was in there not too long ago. Uninvited. Guess what? There's six bed. Oh. Uh, there's six beds on the third floor. There's six beds and there's six places to go on the third floor. And it is a travesty that this minister continues not to use that space. You've had four years to get sprinkler systems in there. You've had four years to fix your own building, Minister, and you refuse to do it. You, were for, you and of the four other ministers be fine, you refuse to do it. It's right there. But yet, you don't open up 24 hours, you don't open up shelters 24 hours a, uh, a day for people. What does this government do? They do the opposite. They were open, they were open longer periods of time. And slowly but surely went from bed for McDonald House to 16 hours a day. And then, for some reason, you moved them to 12 hours a day. Makes no sense. Makes no sense. Because what happens if you have, if you're on the streets and you don't feel good when you wake up, like many of us do? We, we can stay at home, we can, get some, we can get some assistance. What happens to people in the shelter system? What time do they start getting up? Five, six o'clock in the morning, and they have to be out by 7.30 and then move on to the next place. What happens if you're not feeling good? What happens if you're trying to get some reprieve? It's exhausting. And this is what we've done in our, in our system, and it's, it's not... I'm talking like this because it's an easy fix. And it should have been done a long time ago. And you have the components, but we have a disjointed system. And I know exactly what you're going to say. I could probably write your notes for you, Minister, because I've seen this time and time again. What's happening in the system is a, a disjointed um, system that the government does not want to do the things that they should do. And the first thing you should have done is listen to your own report from 2019, findings of community needs assessment on emergency housing. And the first thing you should have done is brought in case management to the province. So that we know, we know what people are doing, where they are, and where they need to, go, to get to. That's in the report. Bring it within the province and understand that case management has to be done uniformly together and with professionals that can do it um, to manage what's happening. And it wasn't done. 
The next thing in that report it talked about was opening up shelters 24 hours a day. It's, it's right there. It's, it's in the report. But we didn't do it. We went the other way. Blooming House, Bedford McDonald House. Um, various shelters need to be open here, especially during a crisis. They don't even open up early. And anybody in Charlottetown knows, and I know the, uh, the leader of the third party knows, that and if the minister has gone down and talked to people, and talked to people in line at Bedford McDonald House in minus 15 degree weather at 7.45 to 8.15 at night. Yep. See what they say. See what they say after a long day. It's unbelievable. And this is happening, and this has happened, and it's not fair. And I know there's, I've, I've read the recommend, I've, not the recommendations, but actually the, the policy about if it dips down be, below a certain degree, how things will change, that's not good enough. Why not just open it up? Just open it up for the winter season so people can, can at least find some respite there. And you wonder why we have, we have a problem that we do. We didn't do everything that we have. I mean, there's been, there's been, um, there's been actions taken. You did get 48 beds in. Um, was it the right approach? It cost, it cost us a lot of money. And is it working? I, I, I don't know. I hear, like, I, 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 got, I try to talk to as many people as I can about it, and they talk to me about it. It's difficult in there. Staff does an incredible job, but it's difficult because people are tired and they're, they're difficult. They're only in there at Park Street Shelter. They're only in there from 8 o'clock till 8 o'clock in the morning. I mean, and then we're talking about case managing, helping people out. How much help do, how much help do we get in society between 8 o'clock at night and 8 a.m.? When, when are these meetings? 8, 6 in the morning? When, when are we giving them help? When are we trying to address their needs? When are we trying to address their addictions? How are we helping people? And it's, and, it's, and it's sad. You know, I've written you letters. I've written so many ministers' letters on different people. And I'm thinking about them now, you know. Yeah, the minister, you did respond. The minister of Social Development responded. But, I mean, it's uh, an acknowledgement response is, I guess, better than nothing. But that's all it really was. They're, st they're still out there. I know where the person is I talked to. I know where the person is. But you know what? He got help, and he didn't, didn't get help from this government. He got help. He got help on his own, so I, I know where he is and what he's doing, and it's great that, that he's doing better, but this is, is happening all the time. You let a person, you let a, you let a person, you, you can, you can talk, you let a person that, yeah, I mean, he's had a really tough life. You let a person in a wheelchair go from the library, wheel his way to Park Street, that's over two and a half kilometers, repeatedly in the middle of snowstorms and, and winter weather. Mm -hmm. So don't tell me this isn't happening. This is happening. This, this happened, and this is happening. Bedford McDonald House is accessible from the outside, but not from the inside, because they only open up the two beds when, when they reach an emergency capacity, which is only triggered if the, if the weather is below a certain temperature. They don't use the beds on the bottom floor, so it's really inaccessible. Even though it's a 10-bed facility, it, they should be using 12 beds all the time. I know this file, and I... I I want us to do better. And opening up these facilities 24 hours would be a start. We talk about this and your transitional housing, before you start talking about everything you've done for transitional housing, it's not been done well enough. We're not transitioning anybody. Well, I mean, Smith Lodge, is it a transitional housing facility right now or is it supportive housing? I know, that, I know what that is, but I hope that you answer, when you answer to this motion, that you answer that, Minister. Because transitional housing is 365 days minus one, and people need to move on into housing, which has not been built. Which has not been built. And it might have been bought in the month of March before the end of the fiscal year. And I mean, that's important housing, but that's not building housing. And people, more people are falling into poverty and can't find a place to live. And we're seeing this consistently. We have to do better. And I know the minister is quite up for the job, and he will be up for the job. It's difficult, and things move very slowly. But don't come up and don't ever use those, what we built shelter beds. Shelter beds are not housing, and that's not a housing first model. 
It's not a housing first model, Minister. <clears throat> Shelter beds are so important. Up the continuum needs to be there. We've struggled, and it's not really your fault. You haven't had enough time. Housing doesn't get built overnight. But over four, four ministers, we've been talking about transitional housing, and it, and it just... It's just not there. The transitional housing supports just aren't there. A lot of people doing a lot of important things, but it's different. There's no consistency um, in this file like it should be. A lot of people working hard, and a lot of people in your department working hard and doing a lot of great things, Minister. But at some point, we need to look at things that we can do right now, and the first thing would be, would be to open up 24-hour shelters. It's very simple. You have the money, the, the Premier said it, he has the money. This, the Park Street, um, the Park Street development, when you add on everything else, you could be looking at, um, to move the Outreach Centre could cost $10 million without us building one house. That's not housing first. That's important for, for, for the issues, but you didn't address the issues the whole way along. So it's costing taxpayers an awful lot of money right now for a one year you have a one year um, time to to get this right and that's all you have and I hope hopefully hopefully it is it is positive for the community but you did, I don't know this government has not spoken to the community and don't say you did because you haven't you've, you've done it in piecemeals here and there um, tried to a little bit, but the communication was lost, and it's not this current minister, it's the minister before him, and the two before him uh, before that. I remember the day I asked the minister on the floor of the legislature, did you, I asked the, I asked the question, flat out, did you buy a curling club? And then my next question is, what are you going to do with it? I didn't want to talk about it then. And then my next question was, before you do anything with that curling club that you bought and you won't tell me about, will you at least talk to the public? No, sir, nothing. Nothing. It was not spoken about. And then we saw it, and we saw it, and we, we, you, you went ahead and didn't talk to the community. And it was, to, it was at that time, the Air Center was at Smith Lodge. Before that, it was on, it was uh, at Birchwood for a little bit. It was at four different locations. This is going to be location number five. We asked about program and services. The Salvation Army tried their best for, for, for a while to, to manage that, but they were not given, they were not given the resources at the time. They weren't even given security. They weren't even given security at the time. And before you know it, okay, yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you. They, they tried their best, but back then, and the numbers weren't, weren't even there. Um, they, were, they were doing their service, but it was too much for them. And then, before you know it, government scrambled. At that time, what did I say to the government? I said, government needed to run this for two to three years. At the very beginning, you needed to run this, and you ran from your, your duties to Health Islanders at that time. And it's too much. NGOs are there to support you. They're there to help. But you, you didn't support them. You're su supporting them now. I mean, there's, it's, uh, there's, there's quite a lot of uh, funding going into those areas and, and support. Um, a lot of money going into security. But you didn't listen. You didn't listen to the guests on the floor of the legislature. <laughs> you didn't listen to people telling you. You didn't listen to the legislative committees afterwards when we gave you the reports about opening up a shelter 24 hours, making sure you consult with the community, doing an independent review of the services three years ago. That's what it said in the committee reports. And, 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 and here we are. And don't for one second say that the community didn't try to talk to you. They did. And the people on the streets have spoken to us and they want it to work. They don't, want, they don't want stagnation in their life. They want housing. They want supports. They want a place to go when they have gotten into trouble and gone to reform themselves at, at, at uh, Sleepy Hollow or in jails. They don't want to be put back out in the streets. They want a plan. 
from the justice minister. They want a plan from the housing minister. They want supports. They want a halfway house. Because if you don't support them in the time of the need, it circles around and it's very difficult for them to continue on their path to sobriety, to continue on their path to trying to find a stable employment and jobs because the streets pull you in. This is an easy, easy motion that we can all support. It's for us just saying, let's open up the shelter systems we have 24 hours a day. Why didn't we look at, now that Park Street's there, it cost taxpayers a lot of money. It was, we brought in the, these units from Alberta when I truly think they could have been built in PEI by Islanders. I mean, I don't understand why. I mean, I mean, well, the minister we just said know. 10 we times know. the amount. Honorable Member Sherrilton, Mr. Wilde has the floor. What would we know? The, it's funny that you mentioned that, Minister, because the, the numbers that the former minister, it's n the numbers that you came out with at the beginning weren't the numbers that we saw at the end. The numbers keep going up and up on, on, on this project. But did you explore that? You know, and that's the question. But now that they're here, why, are, why didn't we take the 48 units and say, hey, let's open these up 24 hours. Let's bring in day supports. Well, they were here. They were here for a year. Let's bring in day supports and try to allow somebody to the establishment and try to meet with people coming in at that time for the last year to see if we could provide them supports and maybe to get them into the detox programs and mental health programs. We can't do that. We can't do that from 8 p.m. till 8 a.m. You can't do that. We needed to at least at least give them till 12 o'clock. We needed to try, but we didn't do that. Now we have more units coming in. So. Really, in a place that th this plan is, is, is not what the standing committee told you. We went across the province talking. We went to four different meetings. We talked. We, we submitted our report in the fall. It was very clear. The first recommendation was a decentralized model, a decentralized model of support. What, what we're, what we're going to get right now is a centralized model and in a, in a compound-like area. How can you get, how can you recover? You close your eyes and you think about where people are. Not one tree around, not one piece of nature. We say, hey, you know what, this is where you're going to get healthy and support. We can do better, we can do better than this. I want people to, to, be, to, to get help. Barbed wire fences up. I mean, who, what, what are we doing? What is this model? They, they, the, people can move now from like a, a Park Street location to get supports during the day and then back to Park Street. That's not, that's a centralized model. That's centralizing a, a, a something. And you know what, the, we, we can, the supports will be there. The human resources I know the minister will provide will be there. I'm worried about the surroundings. I want this and I want the minister to look at a, a decentralized model where we're using, where we're using places across the community, where we're using more church groups, where we're building relationships with people. Let me know how people in my community want to help. The people that have, have spoken to us like Betty Begg um, at that meeting. She spoke about this and different community leaders that are trying and her numbers are up to just get food and supports at Christmas time. People, the community is spinning its wheels. They're working so hard. We heard about it in West Prince. We've heard about it all over in, 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 in eastern parts of Prince Edward Island. Minister, you, you just have an, an, uh, a report that was just done about, about eastern Prince Edward Island in the Montague area. But yet you, you say that we don't, need, we don't need supports there. We do need supports there. We do need a transitional house. We do need something. If, you, if, if you're buying up units, Minister, buy a unit in Montague, a five bedroom unit in Montague, and, and make this a place where we can be there as a safety net for the people of uh, the eastern part of Prince Edward Island. It's happening, we were there, we talked to them. We were there, I saw, I saw people. 
Same thing in Summerside. When we're talking about a shelter, a shelter in Summerside, and we get up in, the, in, in this chamber where everything's recorded and say that the shelter is going to be there before the snow flies. And now, well, are we talking about next year's snowfall? They need this now. They needed this now. And then you see uh, the community groups doing what they can for people. This is not a plan. That's, that's, I talked about it today in my member statement, irresponsibility. That's irresponsible. And Summerside, I watched the meetings. I've talked to uh, councillors in that area. They're, they're, they needed this. And I know the, I know the minister, it's, it's a bigger project and it's diff, more difficult than, than you get on. But we said in this chamber, we were going to do something before the snow flies. And then we, we get, we, we added additional two beds at the shelter that was, uh, the, the native council's running down there. Why weren't those two beds open before? Four beds? Why weren't they open before? You know, did we have the space? Did we build on something in that quick? That's a good news. I mean, you did, you did, you did what you could as, as the minister. I know that. I know. I understand. But I, I guess it's not just, I, did, we didn't just bring that up in the fall session. I guess it's difficult because I've seen it, bef I've seen it from before. I've seen it, I've seen and I've talked to people and I was down and, and people got evicted from different places and in Summerside and, and talked to the community down there. So it's a long lasting thing. But why didn't we, the, the, comp, the, the competition right now, I don't even know if, a, if you've decided on, on who's going to run this and the, the information that you, you gave to people applying was sporadic. The government didn't even know. The government didn't even know what they were doing. They, they came out with um, a, a service delivery contract and they changed it. You guys changed it in the middle. Just changed the criteria. Boom. I know that. Doesn't make any sense. And uh, one of the things is that shelter in Summerside needs to be open 24 hours, at, least at the very start. And that's why I'm bringing this motion forward. I know it's more expensive, I know it's, but the, 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 the 24 hours, the 12 hour difference is on the, the times where people can get better. They need your support during the day. And supporting people on a migration pattern that where some people are able to use and get good services at, at, at different places like the Airway Center. It's good for the people that are getting supports and services and the staff that are working there. And I just toured there. I, I just went and saw them. I talked to them. They're, they're working hard. But some people cannot use those places because it's too close to sometimes the trouble that they might get in in the course of their journey and migrating homelessness. And that's why we see, uh, we see different people all over Charlottetown. And I hope you get a chance to talk to different people. And I talked to some people this morning. Talked to somebody who's at, you know, Smith Lodge. And it's a good thing, it's a good thing that, it's a good thing that he's, he's not there for under the year time because he's been there for over a year's time. So Smith Lodge has helped him bit that continuity. But the problem is, is the next steps. The next steps. Are we dealing with all, um, all the social determinants of health while well, we have the time? And I'm not, I'm not sure <coughs> with a Minister of Social Development and a Minister of Housing and then a Minister of Health, those are three different files. Those are three different files and they, they really need to be one. Because every, because it, it comes across. There's the mental health aspect of things. There's the housing aspect of things, and there's the flat out social development needs of our community, which are growing, and we're moving the wrong way. <clears throat> and everybody's everybody's working hard, but it's the disjointedness that's that's um, <coughs> that's a real issue. So. In this motion, it talks about rebuilding their, re, people rebuilding their lives. And it talks about, it talks about how we're gonna do that. And this is a very small step, and it's outlined in there. A lot of money has been spent. I know there, there, there's a will to fix this problem, 
but this is a, a step that should have been taken before a whole lot of other ones took place. We have to reopen, we have to reopen um, the discussion and have a debate in here about safe injection sites. We have to do that. Um, government tried to, you know, pull a stunt during an election, and that's what it was. It was a stunt during an election with a candidate that, that you shouldn't have never, should have never put him in that position. Never. To, to talk about not putting a safe injection site, where was our leadership? Plus, when, when you drop a writ, the, the, you, you don't really have your titles anymore. I don't know who was making that decision, like a lot of other ones. I don't know who made that decision to say, hey, we're not, we're not moving this. But there's, there's, there's criteria and rules when an election gets called. And um, to, to have someone announce that in, in such a fashion, it was, it was, it was, not, it was not fair. But we have to have that discussion about a safe injection site. Well, the, the information that just came out about fentanyl and what's happening in our province is very disturbing. We're not able to control the flow of drugs. We don't know what's coming into our province, and, and islanders are hurting. They can't go on like this. We have dodged too many bullets, and I'm very scared for stories that appeared on Compass and, and various other ones and people that we talk to in our community. How do you do that? You give people 24-hour shelter, so if they choose, they can get away from that. They're not on the streets. They have some place to go outside and some place or some place that they can just get away from the temptation or the, the grip of the streets. And that's what people would call it. It's there. This problem is fixable. We can fix this problem. There's some asks in here that I hope the minister um, looks at because if you open up 24 hours shelters, it's a will for the minister. You can do this. You can talk to your service delivery providers. They have, they have been there for you during tough times. Um, organizations have been there for you. The, the one common theme to this point in my mind is a disjointed approach from, from, uh, from ministers not setting a clear tone. And that's what the community is saying. Fix that and you've got to bring everybody together because a lot of these problems can be solved. The leadership hasn't been there. And I know you've consulted with uh, an expert from Calgary, Carleen Donnelly. I heard her speak. Um, she's very knowledgeable, understands um, what's happening and, and uh, probably gave you some good advice. And I hope the minister stands up with confidence and and relays whatever the plan was, because to this point, it's been a disaster. Um, so I'm glad you got some outside help. My problem is it's, it's only been a six-month term, and I think it's over in March. We don't even know what the, we don't even know what the contract was, but uh, it's, it's over in March. Um, so I, don't, I need you to, to stand on your own here, be the minister, and, and be the minister of social development, and be the minister of health. And we have major issues that that the three of you will see accountability in this legislature. And I think that it's time that you start listening to standing committees, mm -hmm. your own reports, the people of PEI when they present to standing committees, and the general public. Because to this point, that's been your problem. You just never listened to, to anybody. You wouldn't have any public meetings. You had no public meetings, zero. It's, it's, it's incredible, quite frankly. Get on the streets and talk to them. So there's a real, there's an, there's an opportunity here for you to do this, and if you support this motion, I, I really don't see how you can't support this guiding motion that this chamber says. And this is, this is not, this is, this is just strictly what it is. It is saying, hey, let's look at Blooming House. Let's look at Bedford McDonald House. Let's look at what we have mm -hmm. and open them up during the day because during the day is a chance that we can give support and people can get it and maybe make that transition and have that helping hand. It cannot be done from 8 p.m. until 8 a.m. in the morning. So, um, uh, Mr. Speaker, at the... At the um, at this time, I think I'm going to just keep talking. Yeah, exactly. 
Yes. Okay. No, I can talk about I can talk about this. I can talk about this all day. Put their shoes um, on. Put their shoes on. Yeah. No, I'm not. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna start from the beginning because it's too painful for this government for me to start from the beginning. You got three minutes. When we look at people with accessibility issues, we have to we have to take quicker action. The Outreach Center was, there was always money in your budget to make the Outreach Center accessible. What did we find? It's moving, I know it's moving now. Oh, it's moving, it's great. It's moving. It was never accessible. Not once, not for one day. But guess what? You had the money in your budget to do it. And you didn't make it accessible. If that happened, imagine, you know, there's people, there's people out there that, there's one gentleman who, who, did get, who did get support, uh, went up and, and got support. He was 75 years old in a wheelchair on the streets. I mean, he still needs support. And I, and I know I've talked to him. I know his story. I understand. Um, he's doing much better. Like, he could never get in to the air reach could, He couldn't. It was, it was impossible. And if it's, there to, if it's there to help Islanders, then great. But... In the new contract with the Outreach Center, there's actually less services, Minister. I don't know why. There's actually less services than the old one, but, but the price tag's quite a bit more. Um, I don't understand. You took out primary health in the, in the new contract. I don't understand. Well, first of all, I don't, ever, I, don't, I don't ever think I ever heard a definition of primary health, but it's not in there now. So I, I don't understand why that came out. Primary health is the first thing we have to do. Make sure that people on the street, um, after being out in the cold, don't have foot issues, don't have hand issues, are warm enough, are the, the, colds, uh, the colds that people can pick up on the streets are, are unbelievable. Somebody I, I talked to was, had pneumonia, and luckily a doctor did come in to the area center, I think, and, and, and gave them some support. I mean, that's, that's an important story, and that, that's happening. But it didn't happen, and I don't want to see it removed. So, Minister, I say you amend that contract and put it back in, because people's health is critical. And I know, I know you're moving in that direction. It has been slow to this point. And I want to make sure that you continue to take those directions, that it's people first, and you don't have the right to talk about housing first until you do it. And to this point, you haven't done it. You haven't done it. <coughs> Subsidies are, I mean, in, in the last, in the, last uh, in the update on the um, findings of the community needs assessment, you talk about housing su supplements, which are important, which are incredibly important and growingly important because the cost <coughs> of living is going up. And more and more people can't afford their rent, so those supplements become more and more important. But we need to make sure, we need to make sure that we're giving to the people and making them have the steps to get out. And I think that a good start would be opening up 24-hour uh, shelters in our great province. At this time, Minister, I'd like to adjourn the debate. Uh, do you have a second, Your Honourable Member? Uh, Leader of the Opposition. Thank you. The uh, member for New Haven, uh, Rocky Point, Thank and the so uh, third-party House Thank Leader. you, Mr. Speaker. I now call motion 83, please. Show Kerry. Kerry. Motion number 83, calling on government to prioritize the reopening of the PCH ICU, and the debate was adjourned by the Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Clerk. Honourable members, we will uh, call on the uh, Minister of Health and Wellness to continue uh, debate. So thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the shortage of health care professionals in Prince Edward Island and across the country is the biggest challenge our health care system is currently facing. 
Um, in doing some research for my remarks today, um, I want to reference a, a study done by the Royal Bank and Proofpoint back in 2022. Um, in 2021, um, there were over 2,400 family physician positions uh, posted on government websites across Canada. That same year, um, our current system graduated less than 1,500 family physicians. So obviously there's a deficiency in the production of family physicians. When it comes to positions that are specialized, like those who work in critical care spaces, the challenge is even greater. Appropriate staffing is vital in all our health care facilities for the safety of patients and the well-being of our workforce. Unfortunately, unexpected disruptions in physician, nursing, and respiratory ther therapist coverage has forced us to change how the progressive care unit operates at the PCH. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, if the appropriate staff were available to fill the roles, we would not have made these temporary changes. Again, I want to say, if the appropriate staff were available to fill the roles, we would not have made these temporary changes. Work is ongoing to support physicians, critical care nursing, and allied health staff who are currently maintaining four critical care beds at the PCH. No beds have been closed at the PCH. As we have said, continuing to do this work without more support is unsustainable for existing staff. We cannot stretch our health care workers thin and expect that they will not burn out. The efforts that have been done uh, at this hospital by everybody involved have been quite simply amazing and, and again not sustainable. Our efforts currently are focused on nursing, RT and locum recruitment to support the staff at the Prince County Hospital. I want to be clear that we do not want to redu reduce services there, but right now it's about ensuring the safety of, those, of all those involved. Earlier this month, I attended a town hall in Summerside regarding the PCH. I am appreciative of all those who attended. Thank you to the community members who came out to share their thoughts and their concerns. It is clear that many people are extremely passionate about the Prince County Hospital. I do, however, um, have some concern with the words fight and save. I can assure you that our department, the Medical Society, uh, Health PEI, um, are doing more than they, as much as they can in order to maintain services. It's not a decision that anybody wants to make uh, to reduce services at this hospital. We talk about population growth, and I've mentioned it today. You know, since 2019, the city of Summerside and the town of Cornwall combined have moved to Prince Edward Island. That is placing unbelievable pressures on health care, education, transportation, you name it. With that influx of people, we are challenged to provide these services. I appreciate the opportunity that was also given to the interim CEO, Corinne Roswell, our Chief Medical Officer, Kathy McNally, and myself to answer questions and address those concerns. Um, Mr. Speaker, it comes down to this. It's simple. We need to recruit more health care professionals that can deliver safe and sustainable critical care at the PCH. Health PEI continues to work with physicians, staff, and community members across the system in the stabilization phase and to develop critical care services at the PCH. Since January, we have hired three progressive care unit nurses and one emergency department critical care nurse. We have hired 1.6 FTE respiratory therapists for the PCH, with four more ha uh, interview interviews happening this week. We have signed an agreement with an internal med medicine specialist who will be starting at the PCH in late summer. And we are in active discussions with two more internal medicine specialists. Health PEI has also secured internal internal medicine locum support for critical care at the PCH to supplement the two existing internal medicine physicians. And again, I want to salute our two internal medicine physicians that have maintained um, their presence and their practice uh, at this hospital. Uh, I met with them both during my tour, um, and you can see the stress, um, exhaustion that these these two uh, physicians have uh, and what they've done to maintain this the, the the care that they have done so I want to recognize them there's also a PCH nurse practitioner who will be providing support as a physician extender within the PCU 
We also have an external recruitment firm working to fill the PCH administrator role. Mr. Speaker, I have given Health PEI full authority to do everything possible to get staff hired and practicing here in PEI as soon as possible. With the direct pathways for physicians to get licensed on PEI from international jurisdictions, we have broadened our ability to recruit physicians here from other countries. We are just starting to see the benefits, but this is opening doors that were previously closed. Again, the recruitment phase is long in physicians. Um, there's families, there's schools, there's homes, there's spouses, careers. So an estimate is anywhere from seven to 12 months from an actual yes to actually them uh, arriving um, to Prince Edward Island to practice. So again, we certainly would want to hire somebody on a Friday and have them start on Monday, but it's not always feasible in any position, but especially in healthcare. We are just starting to see the benefits, but it's opening, we are opening some doors. We need more respiratory therapists. They are an integral part of delivering health care, especially in critical care units. <coughs> Unfortunately, we do not train respiratory therapists or many allied health professionals on PEI. And I know our recruitment team did attend an, R an RT uh, hiring fair at the New Brunswick Community College last month. They are dedicated recruitment staff sourcing leads domestically, internationally, and through training inst institutions across the country to fill these positions. We have recently made pay ch uh, changes to the pay scale for these critical positions. The wage we will now pay our T's is among the highest in the country. We also, need, we also know we need more nurses, in particular critical care nurses. We have expanded seats at UPEI, we have created more training opportunities for LPNs at Holland College, and we have had successful recruitment missions to Singapore and Dubai with more planned in the future. I had the opportunity to speak to a nurse uh, the other day about the virtual uh, lab, uh, simulation lab that will be at UPEI, and she expressed a lot of um, excitement that she'll be able to maintain their, her skills and increase her skills no matter where she practices on PEI. So again, another benefit to um, our medical school journey. Internationally educated nurses have already started to arrive on the island with more on the way, and they are integrating the system as, as RNs via the bridging process. We actually had our first international um, nurse show up at Beach Grove on the day of the storm a couple weeks ago. Uh, it did not keep her home. And I went to the bank yesterday, actually, with my youngest daughter to do some banking, and the teller told me that another nurse was in and actually set up her account. And she had a great uh, conversation with, with that nurse, and she was so happy uh, to be on Prince Edward Island. Our plan is to hire over 200 internationally nurses to support our existing workforce. Again, this will take time. We have about over 100 in our pipeline as we speak. The strength of these nurses is also to be noted. In our recruiting mission, missions, we had over 1,400 applicants. We screened it down to 147, and we uh, made job offers to about approximately 45. So again, I'm told that their, critical, uh, their skills are of a higher, high quality and experience. We've also removed an unnecessary hiring red tape like the Physician Resource Planning Committee, which caused unnecessary delays in hiring doctors. As we know, and as I've said in this house before, in 2023, we, have, we did hire 24 new physicians. And reflecting on those uh, physicians, physician deficiency numbers that I spoke about in Canada, um, it's challenging, there's no doubt. Uh, every health department, every health authority uh, is demanding their recruitment team um, try to recruit those 1,400 um, resident um, students um, to practice in their province with 24, over 2,400 possibilities for them to choose from. All these measures are starting to help hire healthcare professionals more quickly and allow us to access talent from Canada and around the world. This is all part of a plan to stabilize the PCH and restore critical care services as soon as possible. Again, I'm extremely grateful for the dedicated, passionate healthcare staff at the PCH especially those in critical care. I know this has not been easy. Mr. Speaker, I want to be clear that the Department and Health PEI is working hard to do everything we can to get more health care workers hired in our system and to fill vacancies at the PCH and all of, all of our facilities. 
Health PEI, the Department of Health and Wellness, Recruitment and Retention, and so many others are working collaboratively on this. We're doing everything, as we, everything we can, as fast as we can, to make meaningful changes to improve the healthcare system. I absolutely support this motion and will continue to work collaboratively with Health PEI on solutions to recruit more staff while supporting our existing staff. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Are there any other members wishing to speak to the motion? The uh, member for West, uh, Charlottetown West Royalty. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister, for speaking on to this, and thanks for the member for bringing forward your first motion. It's, it's a very good one and timely, and, and um, um, as a health care critic on this side, I, I just I wanted to stand up and, and talk to the importance of this motion um, uh, and the importance of the ICU and, 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 and what happened to, to, to get it shut down. It was Mother's Day weekend, and um, we're finding out now in a, in a standing committee that uh, th this government didn't even have the wherewithal to have a meeting. They just got a briefing. <coughs> Um, the Premier said it on Compass. He just had a briefing. Now, what's the difference? I don't know because I don't know, I don't know what, the, what the difference would be, but this needed uh, a, an emergency meeting. It needed the highest level of government to figure out ways instantly about how to keep that place open, and it didn't happen. And it, there could have been ideas. There could have been reach outs to other, other doctors around that, that might have been there for that weekend. There could have been different things. I don't know. If you only had a briefing, if you, if you only had a briefing, it doesn't seem like you did. Did you do everything to keep the IC open? Did you do everything to keep Western Hospital open this week? Did you do everything to look at, at, at the Memorial Hospital? I don't know anymore. Because I know talking with people who have had this position in the past, and I remember hearing about how, they've, how they would do anything and everything to protect health care in Prince Edward Island from the rural to the main. Because a, a closing down 43% of ICU beds in the province is, is a dramatic, dramatic step that will hurt communities. And you saw how badly it's hurt more than half of our island. The doctors had to go to the extent of saying, we are in crisis here. The nurses had to say, we're in crisis here. Respiratory therapists had to say, we're in crisis here. And it's OK to say that you're recruiting respiratory therapists, but you didn't value the ones that we had. You didn't give them a bonus. You, you, you didn't give them. You didn't even extend the, the nurses. You promised an $8 million bonus to nurses. You only paid them out $43 million. Or sorry, $4.3 million. $8 million, $4.3 million. That means that you underspent on the bonuses by $3.7 million. And now we're sitting here. You, you don't have the right to talk about we need respiratory therapists. They needed, they needed not, it's not about the money. It's about valuing people in the system. It's about letting them know how important they are. Nova Scotia gave $10,000 each nurse, $5,000 to everybody else working in the system. Think about that. What did we do? We did not do that. And now we're struggling. And, 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 that, and Nova Scotia saw the writing on the wall. Because when that federal money came in, that latest federal money came in, we sat around and didn't have a plan to spend it, didn't have a plan to value it and get it out there to the people that deserved it, the people that were on the front lines, the, the porters, the cooks, the, everybody that struggled through COVID and beyond to keep our system going. We didn't, we didn't do that. So there, there's some responsibility taken, whether that has to do with the ICU, I don't know. I, I don't know, but I know that when 42 doctors get around and write a formal letter, it's, th that's the last straw. And I think that we've all heard from them. They're there because they love helping people and the patients and people and the families that they work with. You have to be there to show them value for what they're doing. And somewhere along the way, we lost track of that. 
And the Premier says, stands up and says, it's irresponsible for me to give a date to reopen the ICU at the, at the PCH. I say it's irresponsible to shut it down. And I want you to know that, yes, I know there's staffing shortages, and I know that must frustrate the minister beyond because it's, you think it's easy for me to stand up here and do this. But I'm saying for you is we can't lose anything else. This has to be rock bottom for our health care system, and I want you to understand that things have to be done now and things put in place so that we only build from here. And I mean, he did mention some things, and we did mention some some uh, missions and, and, and different things to get to get nurses 31, then it went to 27, I think it was 22. I don't know how many have, are coming to Prince Edward Island. I'm glad for every single one that's coming. But these are, these, these are difficult and we have to be on, on top of our recruiting game. And when we find out that the department's own recruiting staff is only working at 50% complement or less or more or just somewhere around there, it's difficult on this side of the house to say that we're doing everything to make sure that we're both not only getting the recruiters, but also the recruiters are trained and able to do their job and hit the ground running. And that's an important role. So it's, it's, about, it's about us kind of keeping you accountable, and I think you might be feeling that, but now communities are keeping you accountable. And anybody that was in that room in Summerside knows that, and, uh, that, that you, have, you have some work to do. And Minister, you, you and, and your government are responsible for, for setting the policy and direction of Health PEI and both Health PEI and the department. And we're, we have to keep you accountable to that. And we want you to succeed. The, when we start talking about RC, uh, uh, respiratory therapists, when we start talking about the need for physiotherapists, we have to understand that this is a continuum of service delivery providers. When you put in something like um, medical homes, if we don't have staff to, 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 to service the basic needs and we're on, on the outside communicating that the medical homes and neighborhoods are going to be the fix, if we don't have the staff for them, where are they going to come from? They're going to, they're going to get spread across the system. So I, I have to know that we're able to, to, to be there and to fill both the medical homes, our hospitals, our, our, our doctors uh, that, that work independently, and everybody in between in our long-term care facilities. So solutions, solutions are one thing, but we've got to hear straight answers. And y you have to think about the healthcare workers themselves. And I look forward to seeing um, more value placed on the work that they do because they're speaking up and they're speaking loud and clear and we can all hear it, but you're the government and that would, that would mean that you need to take a deep breath and, and do better on this file. So uh, thank you for the opportunity, uh, member, for bringing this forward and, and for me speaking to this. Thank you. Are there any other members wishing to speak to the motion? Now I'll ask the uh, mover of the motion, uh, Borg Gikor, to close debate. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate uh, the members who took the time to, to respond to, to the motion and to the minister for his remarks. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, if there are no other speakers, I would move to conclude the, the debate and call for the vote. Thank you, member. All right, uh, members, all those voting uh, against motion uh, 83, please uh, say nay. All those voting in favor of motion 83, please say yay. Yay. Honourable member, your uh, motion has been uh, passed uh, unanimously. Uh, the member for New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I now call motion number 86 be read. Shall I carry? Motion 86. The member for Borden Kinkora moves, seconded by the member for New Haven Rocky Point, the following motion. Whereas healthcare retention has been an increasing challenge over the past four years, and whereas it is critical that we recognize and respect all healthcare workers in our system, 
And whereas in the fall of 2022, the Premier went against <coughs> the advice of his CEO of Health PEI, the chair of the Health PEI board, and the presidents of several healthcare unions and gave some, but not all, healthcare workers a retention bonus. And whereas, since this decision was made, we have heard from various unions and healthcare workers how this has led to toxicity and discord within the workplace and has hurt retention. And whereas, and whereas as recently as the February 1st, 2024, Summerside Town Hall meeting, we heard how detrimental this decision was to healthcare on PEI. Therefore, be it resolved, the Legislative Assembly of Prince Edward Island urge government to immediately expand the retention incentive bonuses to include all frontline healthcare workers who have not received them. Therefore, be it further resolved that the Legislative Assembly of Prince Edward Island urge government to publicly apologize for excluding some frontline health care workers from receiving retention incentive bonuses, an action that hurt, hurt the health care of Islanders. Uh, the member for Borden Concord to uh, lead debate. Th thank you, Mr. Speaker. I won't take uh, too long. Uh, with my remarks on this motion, the motion is uh, pretty pretty short and self-explanatory. But I would say uh, just a few a few remarks. We've heard in the chamber lots of times in my few days that I've been here the uh, discussion of health care retention uh, being paramount importance uh, coincides with the need to recruit. We also need to retain. Uh, the motion further talks about the importance of recognizing and respecting all of the health care workers that are in the, uh, in the system, and that's what this motion is really about. It's about respecting all of the health care workers that are in the system. Uh, in the fall of 2022, it appears that the, uh, the government was looking for a positive news story and uh, came out with the, uh, the idea of the uh, of the bonus that went to some of the healthcare workers, but not all. Unfortunately, I think what the what the positive news story turned into was one of the best or perhaps worst examples of uh, politics infiltrating into the delivery of healthcare. Um, the 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 situation, unfortunately, um, has created uh, negativity in the uh, healthcare worker sector. Uh, I I heard firsthand from my campaigning in the by-election District 19 a number of people who work in health care, who worked hard during the COVID situation to clean, to do whatever else was called upon of them to do over and above their regular duties, uh, yet they were not recognized for all of the extra work and service that they, that they put in. So unfortunately, uh, the good news story had uh, a lasting negative impact, unfortunately, on our frontline workers. Uh, we heard it at the Summerside Town Hall, uh, along with other complaints at that time. We heard about the rift that it created uh, in the healthcare community. The motion, uh, Mr. Speaker, has nothing to do with the amount of the bonus. I, I will say I have heard from some who received the bonus that um, coming through on the payroll and being subject to the usual statutory deductions um, certainly cut into the amount of the bonus. There were some people who had indicated that it wasn't enough. But this motion, uh, Mr. Speaker, has nothing to do with that. It's simply a motion to do with equity and fairness so that all of the frontline workers who put in the extra hours and continue to put in the extra hours get recognized uh, for all the extra time that they've, that they've done. So we're simply asking in the motion, Mr. Speaker, that the retention incentive bonus be expanded to include all the frontline health care workers who have not received the bonus. And the motion also further calls for government to apologize for the oversight, uh, an oversight uh, that they should have been aware of because we had had uh, the chair of the board of Health PEI at the time come to committee and testify that it was, uh, well, it was, a, it was pretty well a straw that broke the camel's back at that point because it was an interference in the workplace of health PEI and uh, the chair and the CEO knew at the time what the outcome would be and knew what, what would be created by this, uh, by this particular attempt at a political good news story. So we're asking for an apology to extend from government on this uh, oversight and uh, in closing, Mr. Speaker, I would very much look forward to hearing from both the, uh, the Minister and the Premier 
uh, on this motion. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, the member for uh, New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to my colleague from Borden Kinkora for his remarks, and congratulations to my colleague for the passing of his first motion just recently unanimously. Uh, I'm not going to speak long either, and I too am looking forward to hearing from the Minister on this issue and the Premier, because this is really, as my colleague just said, one of those moments in time where uh, a healthcare system that was already challenged and fragile uh, the situation was made much worse because of a very, very poor policy decision, which actually flew in the face of advice from senior advisors. So I think this is a very important and an opportunity for government to acknowledge a mistake that was made. I think all of us individually and collectively um, benefit from acknowledging the mistakes that we made. It's how we learn. And I think this is, without doubt, an opportunity um, for government to do that on an issue which is undoubted, undoubtedly, in, in retrospect, a terrible mistake. I remember, I think back to the early days of COVID when all of our healthcare workers were lauded as being heroes. And around the world, people would, at the shift change, go out on their balconies or front lawns or whatever and, and bang dishes and, and give thanks. And, Sadly, that, but perhaps inevitably, that level of support and that level of love for all healthcare workers dwindled over time and, and reached a point where here on Prince Edward Island, um, certain healthcare workers were, were considered to be more important than others. And, and that was a crucial mistake. Um, and I think the effects of that, as my colleague from Borden Concordia just said, continue to this day. We heard a minister earlier today talk about the importance of looking at governing and within their department holistically. And I think this is a perfect example of when we lose sight of that. All healthcare workers are interdependent. They depend on each other. Um, you cannot operate a hospital without all members of the hospital team being present, being felt valued, being considered to be an important part of a critical team. And when you start picking and choosing which ones within that system are worthy of a bonus, you erode the collegiality, you, you destroy the sense of camaraderie and friendship that those healthcare workers previously felt. I have talked to many folks within the healthcare field who knew that this was a terrible, terrible policy decision. Many of them were nurses, nurses who received the bonus, and yet were fully aware that in instituting this, government was driving a wedge between the people who they arrive, sometimes drive to work with, work shifts together and then leave together, but there was no feeling of togetherness because this government caused them to be strangers to each other and, and not to put it to uh, melodramatically to be adversaries in a system that required that they work together. I'm still, I, as the more I talk about it, the more dumbfounded I am that this ever happened. Anyway, I, I, I don't want to talk much more about this. I, I'm looking for <coughs> solutions, but I can tell you that for the wounds to be healed in this instance, it will require government to make an acknowledgement of the error that was made and to offer the apology that this motion calls for. Not a difficult thing to do. And I really hope that the Minister and the Premier, uh, who are given an opportunity through this motion, will take it and speak to the healthcare workers who need a lift, who need to be told that they all matter. Um, and that this bonus will reach every single critical worker and every frontline worker 
in every healthcare facility across this province is crucial to the effective, efficient delivery of health services. And uh, I look forward to others speaking to this and I thank my colleague for bringing this forward and for offering the opportunity to government to right a terrible wrong. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Are there any other members wishing to speak to the motion? Uh, Cheryl Tan, West Royalty. Yeah, thank you again for bringing this motion forward, and it's a very important one. Um, I think I brought a similar one forward because uh, it's been it's been ongoing for for a long time, and and the amount of calls and the amount of issues we've had around this and and is is quite remarkable. It, it, it doesn't make any sense, you know, that you would give you would give a bonus to some, which it, to, people deserve it. They they deserve it. The ones that that got it, but they have to work alongside in a team setting across across. Um, de, de, nurses have to work with occupational therapists, and they have to work with admitting people. And and for them to say, hey, you know what, I got a bonus, and and nobody else did it. It was it was very difficult for them and it's it's the porters it's the people that make our hospitals whole it's it's the people that that are working every day to to bring services and, and make sure that that islanders are well taken care of in a time of need that we needed that to happen where did we find this in the last budget this was in this was in the special warrant section I mean, it was it was it was under under twelve million dollars, and and asked questions about it, and I think it was in the the very last last section. It was time to pay for this, and that's where I found out it was, it was you know, that's where the money was in a in a section, in under that area, and to to know that I don't think promises were kept. It wasn't an eight million dollar bonus it was much less than that and which left you a lot of money to give to everybody else ask the the the, the former CEO of health PEI just recently just before he had to turn in his badges and ID cards when he had one week left of of work and uh, somebody I don't know who told him his services were no longer needed. Um, he was, was gone just like that. I don't know. I still don't know who has the authority to make that decision. But that was the day after he presented to a standing committee telling the truth about how he saw our health care system. That was his exit interview, and he knew it. <laughs> well, I mean, it's true. You can, you, you can, you can laugh all, all you want, but, I mean, you made, somebody over there made sure of it. Somebody over made, made sure is don't, don't bother coming in because Did you, ask him you, you talked, you talked, um, you talked, you talked truthfully about situations both in Summerside. Who recommended the Honorable members, the bonus honorable members, you'll all get a chance to get on the list and speak. The member for Charlottetown West Royalty has the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Some of the, 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 the questions that I might be hearing with heckling might be, might be in cabinet confidence. I don't know. I don't know what, what's being yelled at me here. But what he said about this bonus, and I asked him flat out, I said, is it, is it, what is it like when some people that you're responsible for get a bonus and other people's don't? And he, he went on and it's, it's recorded and he said, everybody should have gotten the bonus. You can't give some to some and then others to others. So, I mean, that's just what he said. So, I mean, it's, you know, if you want to go, we, we had ministers in there. We had ministers in there. All, all the ministers talking right you guys could have come in, clearly. One of them did in there to talk, uh, to talk and to ask his questions. And, and, and maybe talking. not not to bring in. I told him he lied to Islanders and he didn't ask a single question about it. Ignore it. That minister might have suggested some things that are maybe to talking to a, a CEO uh, using that kind of language. I'm not sure Hanser would have picked up on that, but I was just asking him the questions that I wanted to hear, and, and the minister obviously asked him the questions that he wanted to. But we're, we're talking about... No, I told you what the truth was. That, that was... That was well, I, I, I want to know what the truth is. Truth we know what the truth is. 
No, he's not. What's Charles the trick? Charles has the floor. You clearly don't. Opportunity for for you to you, you you want the floor right now? I'm probably sure you're gonna get it. Yeah. yeah. You'll have time when it's when okay. it's your time. <laughs> like, no, what use idle threats then. No, use idle threats. You're gonna follow through. Follow through. Otherwise, finish your speech and sit down. Honorable members, the Charlie Hamilton Australia does have the floor. And this is the type of actions that we might be getting, and why some Islanders don't speak up. It's why some CEOs on the way out are just trying to talk to us about a bonus, are just trying to talk to us about, about what we need to do for our system, are treated on the way out. But this motion is not about that. It's about what government needs to do and how government, in here it clearly says government should apologize to, to to people that didn't receive. So it's something that, that, that you have to think about and I'll be supporting it because I think that that's, that's an important first step. You know, you talk, we talk about things in our society, that's, that's, where, that's where we are and we have to make this, make this right. And I know the minister has done some things and it's contract negotiations and there's we, things that we don't know about all the time. There's contract negotiations and things going on and I'm sure their, their contracts are going to get an improvement and they'll be, they'll, they'll, they'll hopefully do, get, get on par or if not better with every other service in the country. I, I know that will happen and I'm confident that the minister will will do that and have, have positive negotiations with, with his various unions and that's that's um, I, I'm I'm confident in that, and we'll be we'll be watching. And I know there's been some good good things happen, but we we've got to make sure that we we deal with what what happened in the past. When our what we can we can get to Nova Scotia from the island in about 35, 35 minutes, when they are giving ten thousand dollar bonuses to nurses and five thousand dollars across the board, everybody everybody gets one. That that's very hard for us. To, to compete because there's islanders over there working in the system and that that would would like to come back if we're recruiting would they not feel a certain loyalty to to um, to their employer for doing that we have to do the same we have to make sure that people feel uh, feel that they're they're excited to be here and it's it's not it's not all finances it's about it's about valuation we have to we have to do more Awards. We have to talk highly about what what services people are providing, what they do, what the respiratory therapists do, how that you know it, it, when you transfer. Now that the ICU, if you're transferring a patient that was a former ICU or should be an ICU patient, they need a respiratory therapist there. They need a respiratory therapist from Prince County to come with them to the QEH. Has to be done. Um, now we, we're seeing that that. Um, ICU nurses in that area, and we heard from it at that meeting, had to do that role. That's above and beyond. We don't understand the importance of what respiratory therapists do and every single other ones, OT, physios, um, porters, cooks, LPNs, everybody across, across the across the good world of healthcare. They do so much for Islanders. So I, I really think that this is an easy motion and I think you, you really have to consider this because Islanders have spoken. Um, we, have to, we have to make this right and, and the, the, the future is up to you. You have all the, you have all the cards and, and you know, a bonus that went to some and others can't happen again in Prince Edward Island. You, you did say it yourself, the, the, money, the money is there, and we've got to spend it in the right places. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, leader of the third party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> and thank you to the member for, for bringing this motion forward. I think that it's important that when a mistake is made, it's acknowledged, and um, we can move on from there, because acknowledging mistake is the only way that, that we can fix it. And one... As a, a former teacher and, and as a mom, one of the things that 
I can remember working really hard on in my classroom and I can remember working really hard on with my son and it's still a work in progress and honestly causes me a great deal of stress is when he doesn't take responsibility for his actions and when students wouldn't take responsibility for their actions because they grow into adults who don't take responsibility for their actions and I think that that is problematic. And I say again, we can't, if we don't acknowledge a problem, it will never get fixed. A simple sorry, you have no idea what that would do for your government. I hear, I meet with people on a regular basis, union members, healthcare workers who are still upset by this. How many times has this been spoken about? We may sound like broken records, but this really matters. And I've been hearing a lot of, of heckling coming from over there about um, the truth and, and what opposition should be doing and, and et cetera, et cetera. This was a government, oppor a government, a government um, opportunity. The truth is that this was a government decision. Um, he made a mistake. And cabinet confidentiality doesn't seem to mean much when we're getting that heckling. And maybe I'm misunderstanding something, but to me, these are decisions that are made in cabinet. So why would you, you're the one saying it. So nothing changes if we don't acknowledge a problem. And, and I'd like to share something that I saw with you yesterday that this really made me think of the retention issue. And it's, it's important phrases we should all be willing to say as we learn and grow. In light of that new information, I have changed my mind. Oh, I didn't know that before. I guess I was wrong. From the evidence provided, it appears that I need to rethink things. You make a strong argument. I'll consider what you said. I can't support my opinion. I don't know why I think that. I never thought of it that way. Thank you. Now I will. And those are things that, that I try my best. I'm certainly not perfect. Um, I make mistakes. I try to acknowledge my mistakes when, when they happen. And, and I've changed my mind on different things in this house based on information that, that I've received. And I think that this is an example, a really prime example of that. And I would really, this would be a time that I would really um, stand up and applaud government for being courageous and for, for doing the right thing. So um, I think that healthcare workers deserve to be really valued and I think that this is a really strong message that government can, set, can send them. Whether, whether you take that opportunity or not is up to you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The uh, Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks for the opportunity to, to speak to this motion. Um, I agree. Um, I guess my first statement would be um, during my tour, I probably met with, uh, I, I think I lost count, but probably three, 300 healthcare workers. And, and I can assure you that um, this topic was discussed at length in those meetings. Um, very difficult to have those conversations with our valued healthcare workers. So um, I th we, you know, we spent the time to listen to those healthcare workers and understand. Um, their concerns. Uh, one of the things that I have uh, done as minister uh, starting in this portfolio is we do uh, quarterly union meetings. So I think it's important to have the discussion as a group um, on issues. I won't lie, the meetings are not easy. They're, they can be difficult. Um, and that's, that's okay. Uh, we, that's the, I understand that. So I do appreciate the opportunity to meet with our union por uh, partners on, on a quarterly basis. Um, I try to insist on an agenda and action items so that we can have uh, productive conversations uh, with regards to union issues. Again, we always want to support the collective bargaining um, process uh, that we do. Um, it's very, very important. Um, so again, retention is something that's important. I think uh, healthcare retention has been an issue for a lot of years, uh, not just the last four or five. It's a difficult uh, career path uh, for sure. Um, I have family members in that field who work during COVID uh, under very scary situations uh, with lots of interaction with the public, um, very fearful and all that, but um, they went to work at each and every day. Also during Fiona, um, my wife particularly um, worked in the dark with a flashlight uh, miner's helmet kind of on at the pharmacy for a couple days to ensure people that needed their medications were getting it. So it isn't a job that you can call in sick to very often. Um, we are so dependent on these workers and how important it is uh, for them to 
to show up and serve the public. So I do want to recognize the challenges that they have. PCH is another great example. Um, it's heart-wrenching and to hear when a nurse stands up and uses the word that she feels like she's drowning at work. That is a very impactful statement. Um, we want to throw any life preserver to that worker whenever they feel that way. We know it's challenging. We don't want to uh, cancel services due to lack of staff for lots of reasons that's been talked about in this house. So again, you know, um, retention of, of our, our health care workers are important. You know, when you look at some studies, I know sometimes I'm known as, as, as the golf PEI guy, but I was the president of a publicly traded company for about nine years and had a staff of about 40 staff in extremely competitive information technology um, sector where we valued our employees and we um, really depended on uh, some of our software developers and programmers. They had an innate knowledge of our business practices and so on and so forth. So I understand that... Um, Competitive wages, flexible scheduling, career advancement opportunities um, are really important. Uh, employee feedback, which again, I think we did a, a very good job in some of the tour, and I would just want to emphasize that the tour is not finished. Um, we will continue to do another lap because um, we were quite booked at um, all the facilities that I visited. Um, another comment, I think, um, from my tour is I think we need to empower some of our mid-level managers to do more um, at those levels to support our health care workers. Um, one facility, they wanted an outdoor space for lunch. I'll use that as an example that they thought it would be important to provide that to them. So um, security was another issue um, that came up during my tour that people wanted to feel safe. So we are embarking on adding security to some of our <coughs> facilities uh, to support those workers because we heard that loud and clear um, during the tour. So again, creating a safe environment is another important thing uh, for healthcare workers. They are under a tremendous amount of stress. The public is sometimes very stressed when they arrive at our facilities. Um, so we want to have them uh, feel safe um, in, in their jobs. Um, recognition is definitely another part of retention, um, back to my past work experience. Um, we need to have some kind of a recognition program for not only years of service, but uh, perhaps to recognize um, other activities that they do uh, in their workplace. Um, it's important, um, all the studies show that, you know, recognition comes in very many ways, um, and that's another way that we can do it. Um, even to your point about the, the amount of the bonus, and again, back to the budget, budget I guess the honorable member is not here, and he always references $4.3 million of $8 million spent. Again, back to the budgeting process, we always, there's some variability in everything. We don't know who will be eligible. Um, even back to employment at Health PEI, it's like asking what time it is. It's 12.01, it's 12.02, the numbers change. So it's not an underspend uh, on deliberate. Um, to do that, that's just the process that we all live within government in allocating funds to certain projects. So again, um, our healthcare workers um, with the tour, it's important to continue. I think the quarterly meetings with our unions have been very valuable um, to start. I think we've only had a, two or three so far, but I think um, we can start to make progress and again, influence the collective bargaining process the next time around so that we fill some gaps uh, in some of my remarks that I spoke of today. Um, again, the tour was, it was difficult. I'll be quite honest with the House to, to sit with groups of people that were in, um, weren't in the uh, stabilization uh, plan. And time? Uh, yeah, we're... Adjourn debate. Adjourn debate with the seconder, from Minister. Seconder from the Minister of Economic Development innovation. and in Innovation and trade. trade. Thank you. And Minister, I'll remind you that we don't mention if other members are in the House. Oh, that's not. right. That's right. Sorry. <coughs> the Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move seconded by the Minister of Finance that the first order of the day be now read. Shall I carry? Carry, carry. Order number one, consideration of the estimates in committee. 
Deputy Premier. Mr. Speaker, I move, seconded by the Minister of Finance, that this House do now resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole House to further consider the grant supply of His Majesty. Shall I carry? I will ask the uh, member for Rush to go Emerald to uh, Chair Committee of the Whole. <coughs> The House is now in a committee of the whole House to consider the grant of supply to His Majesty. Uh, we were an innovation PEI, uh, and it was brought back by the Minister today in tabling a document. So total business development, $61,585,200, shall it carry? Carry. Total. Are they going to bring it again? No, I, I figured we just finished this off because you, you got the documentation back that you wanted. So we just carried that section total Thanks. business development as you agreed upon. But Charlotte Town West. Right? The, yeah, but can we ask questions on on it now that we've got the documentation back? Um, I don't think that was the uh, agreement. The agreement was if the information was was brought back, the section would be carried. <laughs> that's that's the way I understood it. Yeah, that's what do you have any questions? Carry. Can I make a comment? Sure, lead it third party. Thank you, Chair. And I, I want to thank the, the Minister and, and the Department for getting that getting that back. Um, and I guess I just will say I'll, you know, it's kind of a document right now, so to keep an eye on what's happening and keep an eye and ear to the businesses to make sure that, that we're not losing that the innovation and the, the new startups that the startup zone supports, because I think it's crucially important as we consider innovative innovation in Prince Edward Island. And so just keeping an eye on this and, and uh, yeah. Duly noted. Shall the total carry? Carry. carry. Uh, total innovation PEI, 66,185,300. Shall it carry? Carry. All right. The section has carried. We're going to move on to education and early years. Thank you, Minister. So, members, uh, we're just going to uh, get the Minister of Education and Early Years onto the floor. All right. Welcome, Minister. Um, would you like to bring on a uh, stranger? Yes, please. Shall it be granted? Okay. Well, hello, stranger. Would you like to state your name and uh, position for the record, please? 
Chris Ross, Director of Finance and Administration with the Department of Education, Early Learning and Culture. Welcome, Chris. Welcome. Uh, Minister, did you want to say anything before we get started? No, it's great to be here. Thank you. All right. Yeah. So we'll start, um, and we are going line by line. Is that correct? Okay. Finance and Administration. Start Yes, yes, yes. Uh, these are appropriations provided for the operation of the Office of Minister and Deputy Minister and other administrative support services for the Department as well as for the cost related to Land and Property Division of the Island Regulatory Appeals Commission. Um, is, it, is it the will of the, of the uh, Assembly that we go line by line or can I just read the title, Total Finance Administration? The total, sorry, Total Finance Administration. Yeah, okay, great. We'll do that then. Um, so the total finance administration is six million eight hundred twenty-five thousand. Any questions? Yeah. Oh, sorry, I'm not sure what you're, what's happening. <laughs> did you? Did you? Are are we? Like, are when you say line by line, is, are you going through this page right now? No. That, the that, next one. That's one that we we never do with the expenditures and revenues. We we're on page forty-four. And, and we're asking questions right now on finance and administration. Yeah. So we're just not going to read everything. Is that yeah, right? and, and instead of, I'm just going to read the total finance administration, and then you can ask questions oh. to your heart's content, and uh, then we can carry that section. That's good. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> Chair, <laughs> trying to stall here. I need some more education. I guess. <laughs> you gave us permission. All right. So who who does anyone have questions? All right, uh, leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Welcome back, Chris. Thank you. Um, so I'm just noticing there's been a, a decrease in the salaries, and um, last year there was an underspend in salaries. So I'm wondering, what is there a, a is there a position here that's not being continued? Oh, actually, a decrease. Look at that. Oh, just wait. Now them look. I guess it is kind of it's kind of static. Okay, sorry. Never mind. Right. I'm gonna next question. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, so for for Iraq, um, there's a slight increase to Iraq, almost um, 150,000. Um, can you tell us what this will include? It'd be a combination of collective agreement increases and uh, one more additional staff in their rental division. All right, leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, and so the the grants that are provided to Iraq under this section, can you explain those? <coughs> Can I explain what, sorry? The grants to Iraq under this section? It's just a, an operating grant, uh, 2395000 Is that the third party? Thank you, Chair. So is this, is this the full operating budget for Iraq? No. No, Iraq could have a substantial budget with other revenues. The total budget would be around uh, $4.2 Right, leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. And how much funding is being provided to IRAC for uh, to fund the rental office under the new tenancy legislation? I can tell you the rental budget in 22, 20, or sorry, 23, 24 was 1.25 million for that division. And what is it? It'd, it'd be an additional position on top of that. So. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and was there any funding to support education around the new Tenancy Act in the budget? Not that I'm aware of. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. And any funding under this section to provide legal assistance to tenants who are um, parties or potential parties to tenancy um, proceedings? Not that I'm aware of. <coughs> Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. And any funding in any other part of the budget to support um, <coughs> education and legal assistance for tenants? Not in our budget, no. A member from Charlestown West Royalty. Uh, thank you. Um, so there, there is a slight <coughs> increase in salaries. Is that just um, to cover off uh, regular increases? Yeah, collective agreement increases would be the difference between last year's budget and this year's budget. Charlestown West Royalty. Um, so there is a there's a slight uh, well there's a travel and training it looks like it was it was static thirteen thousand four hundred was that mainly for training what was um, and there's a there's an increase next year you're you anticipating additional training or travel 
uh, there's a small increase in, in province travel. So the town west royalty, and that's that's just to to, to mileage claims. When oh, people are okay. Traveling. So it's so the town west royalty. Okay. Um, the provincial learning and distribution center. I know there's two positions there. Could you tell me a little bit about what that that is? That's actually the next section. Oh, is it the next section? Okay. So uh, here it looks like it's in the well. Same so Okay. Charlottetown West Royalty. So Iraq, um, that operating grant is 2.395 million. Um, is that, that looks like, I know, I think it might have said, but I just didn't hear, the, the increases from this year to next year is, is what's, that, what's that for? Is a slight uh, increase? Same thing as our department, uh, collective agreement increases and one additional position for the rental division. Charlottetown West Royalty. Did they overspend uh, last year 2.405? They're forecasted to be 175,000 uh, over budget in this year. Charlottetown West Royalty. What was that for? Did they have an extra position on or? No, it was on the, the revenue side. There was some soft revenues in one of their areas. Okay. Leader of the third party. Um, does the current funding structure for IRAC, do you think, it, does it, does it do you feel that it's a lot? Does it allow them to operate to their fullest potential? Like, did they, have they asked for more or? I, I can't speak for IRAC, but I, I think it's a pretty good increase, 165,000 over 2.2 million. You have a third party. Thank you, Chair. And the uh, oh, other okay, the, sorry. Um, the Council of Ministers of Education of Canada is getting an increase of 28,000. Can you tell us what this grant is for? The Council of Ministers of Education is a, a, a body that all the provinces jointly fund and they determine the overall budget and then reallocate it out to the provinces and that represents our increase to the overall budget. The other third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, and there was an announcement that included in the budget address um, and handout highlights that there was an increase to the breakfast program at all public schools. And this increase was 55000 over 62 schools. So <coughs> each school would expect about $900 extra. Is that? Uh, it wouldn't be that simple of a formula. They look at all the breakfast programs, uh, all the snack programs, and the population of the schools, and then distribute it out uh, equitably in that regard. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. And do we think that with the, I mean, the, the rising cost of groceries, is that, is that enough like for the, the demand? I think they've received substantial increases. Um, it wasn't too long ago. Maybe four or five years ago, it was only 100000 Yeah. So. Charlottetown West Royalty? Um, so, the, 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 uh, what is it like when, when you give Iraq a budget and then they overspend by <clears throat> you know, almost $200,000? Like, do, when, did, when do you find out about that as a department? We do quarterly forecasting at the IRAC. Charlottetown West Royalty? So, can they just overspend, or is, is Iraq an organization that has caps on it and they, they can't overspend? No, uh, they're, they're one of our crown corporations, so certainly they, they try to maintain their budget, but um, some things like the revenues are difficult to control sometimes. So. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Shall I carry? No. Oh, um, leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, so two years ago, there were cuts made to the, the breakfast program. Um, it used to be the funding was uh, four hundred thousand, and it was cut back. And is is there any why? I guess I'm asking why was that cut and why we wouldn't fund it back to the to I that level. I don't believe there was any cuts. I don't have that far back with me, but no. uh, there'd be no cuts to the breakfast program. There might have been during COVID an extra amount provided just um, at, at that time with rising costs and things, but yeah. as far as budget to budget goes, there wouldn't have been any cuts over the years. Okay. Okay, uh, shall I, oh, shall I tell my well? General General in this, I don't want to miss anything in the future. Is there something that, that we should be asking about in this that would, uh, that's not seen and like, I just think about asking a breakfast program later on in different sections. Um, not sure, I'm not sure what you mean. <laughs> well, in, in the minister's right. office, the deputy minister is responsible for a lot of things. I just don't right. want to miss, like the breakfast program. Where's the Where's the budget in? Where's the budget for the breakfast program? It's in this in this section in your grants handout. 
Yes, member, there's been a number of questions on the breakfast program already. I'm going to go back to leave it to the third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm wondering if there's been the, the service costs for the community use of schools. Is there anything in this budget for that? Yeah, that was added in the, the previous budget, and it'll be maintained. Um, so PSP, if you go on their website, they I think it's on their website anyway, they have their policy around um, who gets charged and who doesn't, and there's not very many groups that would be charged to use schools. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. So that's why there wouldn't be a need to increase it. There's been no need to increase it that's based right. on that. Okay. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Can you tell us about the new innovative teaching grants? Yeah, sure. Um, that's a new program for this year. It's going to be a, a competitive grant program for PSB and CSLF teachers to support some teacher-led initiatives related to innovative teaching practices, um, specifically targeted around critical thinking, emotional, social emotional learning, student well-being, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. That's that's uh, that sounds good. Um, so there's a decrease to the Atlantic Province's special education authority by over five hundred thousand. Can you explain that? So budget to budget, uh, APSE is actually receiving an increase of twenty five thousand. Uh, the current year forecast was higher uh, than budget by five hundred fifty thousand. Need a third party. Thank you, Chair. And I, I guess my last question for this section is: Is this where it would also we would also find? Um, uh, I guess, I don't know how the wording, not funding, bump up funding, whatever, to the school food program. That's the school food program's not in our department and be in social development. Right, okay. It's out of the total carry. Carried. Okay, um, provincial learning materials distribution center, appropriations provided for purchasing and distribution of learning materials for programs. Total provincial learning materials distribution center, 970,100. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so there's not been any increases in learning material for programs. Were there no new programs for this year? So this would be the ongoing refresh of textbooks in the school system. So it's our, our book depot where at the end of the school year, schools re return the books and they'd be repaired or replaced. I think what you mean is more like pilots and new programs, and that would be in the English programs and French programs divisions. Okay. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. And so there was a bit of an overspend last year. Um, what was that? Um, in, in this section, each year it kind of varies on uh, how many books need to be replaced versus repaired and, and which books those are. Some of them can be $200, $250, and some of them less expensive. So this year it uh, happened to be a lot of books that were uh, expensive. Um, so we were over about 250000 on our forecast, and it's it's, uh, it's an area that we're going to watch in the coming year and see if we need an increase next year. Thank you, Chair. All right. Uh, Child Carey? Carey. Total finance and administration, 7795100 Child Carey. External relations and educational services. Um, do you need me to, re to read the description, members, or can I go right to the total? Yeah? Appropriations provided for the management of external relations in the areas of federal and provincial policy, French language, Aboriginal affairs, and corporate services, including research, policy and planning, statistical data and analysis, legislative development, and teacher certification. Total external relations and educational services, 2,143,800, shall carry. Charlottetown West Royalty. <clears throat> yeah, there is uh, there's an increase in salaries of, uh, in, your, in your forecast for next year. Uh, what, what's a couple hundred thousand? Uh, yeah, there's uh, 200,000 approximately increase in this section. Um, part of it would be collective agreement increases. Part of it would be we had a position shared with uh, another department to work on the autism coordination and the literacy uh, strategy. And we're taking on that full position now. It's, it's become a, a full-time <coughs> position in our department. And But the biggest increase would be we have... Uh, a uh, few student well-being positions in this division. Most student well-being team members are outside our department, but there's a few in this one, and two of them that we have currently are family support workers. We did a pilot last year where we added two, and we're adding two more family support workers to expand that pilot. Charlottetown West Royalty. Oh, so that, that so the student well-being um, family support. Workers, so we went from yeah. two to four. Yeah. Um, 
Where are they going to be located? Where are they now? Where are they going to be located? The two we have currently are in the Bluefield and Montague families of schools, and uh, the next two will go to Charlottetown and Summerside, okay. and then hopefully expand it again next year. Charlottetown West Royalty. Yeah, and so that that's that's a it's a good program, student well being. So, but there's more than four across. These are just four in this section. Just the family support workers is four. But okay. there'd be youth workers and yeah. nurses, I believe, and other members and other departments on the team. Mm -hmm. and the Oak Charlotte Town West Royalty? Yeah, I'll keep my hand up. Sorry, Chair. I, it's my fault. Um, uh, so families, uh, obviously, we're, we're seeing from student well-being, because it's a growing thing. It's about five, five years or six years, maybe. Um, so we're seeing more supports needed for family so that the student is has to be surrounded by is that, is that what the positions are more family support when the student leaves home that's right yeah so that that becomes um a bigger need i guess when you mentioned it's a pilot program it's a pilot program in addition to what we had um when when are we looking at um are we looking at incorporating that obviously and 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 uh, when will that be full-time full-time program when will it be in all families of schools yeah um well i would predict next year yeah there's Probably. only a three or four families of schools left so okay child time much wealthy it's just the word pilot kind of um is that, does that mean that we're going to get some data on that um is there going to be a report or, or how are we going to evaluate the data yeah. um from that pilot yeah it'll be evaluated within our department um but it was going well in the bluefield yeah. and montague so we want to expand it a little more and, and then evaluate it. That's great. That's Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. And thank you for that. Um, those are important positions and supporting families because when you're working with a child, with, with a student, they go home. You're part of a system. So, so I really appreciate that. Um, so one of the recommendations from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was that there be somebody in, um, in a, like a, with a senior position, so whether it be deputy minister or whatever, um, that is indigenous. Mm -hmm. Is that something, if, if that were included, would it be in the section of the budget? Mm -hmm. There's no new senior leadership positions in our department in the budget. Mm -hmm. Thanks um, for the question. We have, however, um, repurposed one of our positions, and we are in the process of hiring a, I don't know exactly what we're titling it, but a reconciliation lead of sorts. I believe it's currently posted or is, has come down. So it's, um, yeah, absolutely being added to the group. So, yeah. Need a third party? That's great. Thank you for that, too. Um, so what would the statistical data and analysis include? Uh, there is a, a person in this department that does focus on data, such as enrollments. Lead a third party. Thank you, Chair. And so, would there, how, how would we compare with other provinces in that? Like, is that <clears throat> as far as enrollments, or is it is it just enrollments for that for this? Uh, I'd have to bring back their full line of duties, but certainly that'd be a, a focus. Leader of third party. Thank you, Chair. And reviews. Um, do we have any reviews currently happening within the department? Uh, I'd have to ask that and bring that back. Uh, Charles Town West Royalty. Yeah. Um, thank you. What, what is the um, what is the uh, school uh, revenue replacement for a hundred thousand? So, uh, previous to the Healthy School Lunch Program. Um, some of the vendors would provide commissions to schools, which would help them in their school budgets. So when the Healthy School Food Program came in, those vendors said, we're not doing those commissions anymore. We didn't want those schools to fall behind on their programming budgets, so we replaced them. Mm -hmm. So how much royalty? I, I, I don't really fully understand, but. So if you were a, a lunch provider at a school, you may have given the school $1,000, $2,000, whatever the amount was, for allowing you to come in and sell lunches. So when the new healthy school food program came in, those vendors were, you know, some of them still around, but not paying commissions anymore. We didn't want the school budgets to suffer, so we're providing a supplemental grant to the school. Charles, don't watch royalty. Okay, did, did that solve the problem? Well, we just replaced what they were getting from the vendors. So. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Hey, Charles Carey? No. Oh, sorry, yeah, leave it third um, party. Um, so, We've implemented a new data collection tool, uh, PowerSchool. 
And I'm wondering, have we done any analysis on that program? Well, it's a software, and this section would have the lead for that software in it. You know the third party? So it wouldn't necessarily include um, any sort of, I mean, you're going to use the word review, but a review on it to see how the effectiveness of the program? Uh, it was, it was more like replacing an old dated software with a new, uh, more intuitive software. Okay. Leave a third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, so are we building some sort of mechanism to, to uh, be able to uh, gather data with social, to kind of merge health and, and education social data? Is there any sort of <coughs> work undergoing in that? Kind of understand <clears throat> our students better, like to look at them a bit more holistically? Uh, th there is a student services module in PowerSchool, but <coughs> as far as us in health systems, not that I'm aware of. Charles okay. Thomas Royalty. Yeah, I'm um, just asking about planning, and I want to uh, say, the Minister, uh, there's been a lot of work done with the, with the Grade 8 BIPOC um, women's uh, project um, that's under planning and, and policy. What, how, how, did it, how did it go in the initial, uh, the initial outset, and, and what's the plan for that program? Yeah, thanks uh, for the question. I think it's been really well received through our schools. I can certainly um, connect with Debbie Langston to get some feedback regarding, how, again, how it's been received on the ground. But overall, I have been hearing positive feedback. So it was a lot of work. So I appreciate all the work that uh, Debbie did along with her her team and um, partners like the Advisory Council and Status of Women. Yeah, it was a good project. Charlotte Thomas Royalty? No, and it really was. And I just kind of, uh, I, I, I know it will keep going because um, a lot of good people were there. I just want to see what, where we're moving next or how we're going to incorporate that. And did the federal government come in with any kind of assistance with that? Are you able to get assistance with that? I know there's some, there's some funding nationally to, to help with BIPOC projects. And mm -hmm. did you know of any assistance you got or anything? No, not specifically, um, but I can certain, we can certainly go back to the department uh, to inquire with regard to any, any um, additional funding, but I think we'd be aware between Chris and I and know that not that I'm aware of. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I'm wondering, this, this may not be the right section, but I'm wondering if there's been any, um, any uh, policy set, because I hear from parents who are frustrated with bus rides, I'm sure we all hear that. Mm -hmm. um, is there any policy being set on how long a bus ride can be for a student, and, and would that be based around age if there was, if there were? The, the Transportation Division would be in the Public Schools Branch section, mm -hmm. uh, okay. almost at the end of our budget. Mm -hmm. All right, Child Carey. Nope. Oh, sorry. Leader of the third Thank party. Thank you, Chair. Is this the section that funds will be found for the school board elections? It was last year. There'd be no cost in the current year. Okay. Uh, oh, leader of the third party? Um, so I guess I'm wondering if there's any lessons learned from that, if there's going to be any improvements made to that process, or whether it be to the process or to the budgeting mm -hmm. aspect of it. How do we feel that went? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've been in many discussions regarding um, the the future of the, the elections and how we can better make it better really and, and get more voter turnout and that so um, I think it was overall I think and we're really pleased with the board and the members that came forward and we're, we're um, again I think given historically what voter turnout has been like. I think we, we are we are happy, um, but there's further improvements that could be made, so. You know the third party? I, I guess my last question, and this isn't really a question you can answer, maybe, mm -hmm. but it's not really fully <coughs> budget related, but is there any talk about allowing um, P, uh, permanent residents to vote in the next one? Again, another item that's discussed uh, at length, so, yeah. Okay. Carey. Carey. <coughs> All right, moving on. English, French as an additional language. Appropriations provided for the delivery of English, French as an additional language program <coughs> within the public education system. Total English, French as an additional language, 689,600. Shall it carry? Yes. 
No. Charlotte Town West Royalty. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, material supplies and services is, is going up quite a bit. Obviously, we're probably getting some. It was it computer software or something. Uh, this this division um, houses international tuition affiliate schools and the EAL assessment part, not the actual EAL program that's in the public schools branch. So this would be materials for the increased assessments as as the population grows. Charles Thomas Royalty. So what are your numbers projected for next year versus what were your numbers this year? Do you have any numbers about like how many students? Yeah. Or in total? Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, currently we are at 3,300. Oh, Charlotte Town West Royalty. Yeah, so then how, how that works, so we have three, that's, and that number is up from last year, I would assume? Uh, the end of June last year, we were at 2,900, approximately. Charles Town West Royalty. Um, yeah, uh, thank you, Chair. So that number is going up. So the materials that would that would be the testing of it is going up. So the, the increased demand and needs. And there we have we see that that is is uh, is that going to be a large chunk of where our teachers have to go. I know that you know if there's more if there's an increase in international students with with language needs, are we is that where a large portion of our funding will some more of our funding will go. This is just the initial in, intake assessment. Right? Oh. So in, in the public schools branch, we would have um, a significant number of staff, about 175 staff. Yeah. Um, with, <coughs> and there are some additions to the EAL staff when we get to that section. Okay. So now the town West royalty? It just seems like a lot for just an intake test. Would you, 115,000? Uh, and materials, materials and, and yeah. stuff to help. Yeah, okay, perfect. Charlotte Town West Royalty. So salaries um, are static, but the numbers are rising. Um, do we need any more positions in there, or is, it, that's ju is that just a, a regular bump from 375000 to 413000 Yeah, this again, this is only a collective agreement increase in this section. The, we have considerable investments back in the public schools branch section in the EAL division. Do you have a third party? Okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I, pre I was thinking this was a section that um, EAL teachers and, and program would be in, but I, and, and, I, and I hear what you're saying about what is in there, but I, do, I still find it, I guess, a bit surprising. I would expect the numbers to be a bit higher based on the, the significant population growth. Um, do you know, has, I guess, this, I, don't, I don't know who this question would be better suited to, but when the population framework was being done, was this, was EAL teachers, was that a specific uh, conversation that was had with the Department of Workforce Advanced Learning and Population? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Shall we carry? Carry. All right, total external relations and educational services, 2,833,400, shall we carry? Oh, Charlotte, oh sorry, that was the budget line. Section. Section. I'm just having trouble keeping up with the chair. All right, then. Page 46, English education programs and services. Appropriations provided for divisional management for various grants relating to the delivery of English elementary and secondary programs. Total English education programs and services, 4120200 Leader of the third party. Chair, um, would this be, I, I get, there was a question asked, I didn't catch exactly, but would this be where the, the ask for BIPOC usher last year to have a position created within the department? Um, is that, would that be in this section? Yeah. There, there is a, a position in this section that exists. Um, mm -hmm. That might be the one you're referring to, Debbie Langston. Maybe? Mm -hmm. Say that again. Debbie, Debbie Langston's position is, is that the one is you're that, referring to. That's, that's in yes. this. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Leader of the third party. Um, so I, I, I was just going to ask you questions about that program. You've already answered those, so I won't go back there. Um, so I'm wondering. Uh, I don't know if this would be the place to ask about either, but wondering about um, civics education. I know that 
we had passed a motion in the house and I've been reading a lot. It's, it's kind of something that's got a lot of attention on it right now. I was reading in the parliamentary magazine that we received, there was a civics education round table mm -hmm. and just the, the importance of, of getting, we know it's a habit forming thing mm -hmm. and, and engaging people when, when they're young because our lowest voter turnout is 18 to 35. So has there been any more discussion in the department on that? Yeah. So the department um, did create a new course for our grade 10s. I think it's be currently being um, uh, rolled out in nine different schools, Chris, I believe. I think nine different schools are participating, and I, I think it'll be rolled out system-wide um, here in the, in the next year. But I hear, I understand it's going very well. I've, I've reviewed the course material and all of it. It's, it's, yeah, it's tremendous, and I appreciate all the work that's gone into it. So that's, I think, a major change um, that we have seen. It's in collaboration as well with the um, with elections PEI as well as federal elections. I think that's civics. Yes. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. And is that is that is that a uh, like a required course for students in grade ten? Not currently. Elected. No. Our lawyer of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Right. I'm wondering uh, if there's been any new STEAM programs added this year. We have increased our funding um, through the Interministerial Women's Secretariat to STEAM PEI as well as um, Skills PEI and the, there's another organization to deliver STEAM programming. I know we've also, through education, we've had increased partnerships with STEAM PEI to deliver programming in our schools. So yeah, there has been, um, Definitely an emphasis on STEAM within our province, and I'm hearing it all the time with parents that, uh, yeah, that's, yeah. It's, it's been tremendous, so, yeah. yeah. Good. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. And how about um, any additional uh, investments into trades and high schools? Has there been any bump to that? So this section um, has deal. curriculum leaders who are essentially teachers um, pulled out of, the out of the schools into our department from anywhere from one to <laughs> ten years, and they are constantly <coughs> working on updating curriculum in their own section with the 973,000 of materials and supplies and services. Mm -hmm. So within this section, there are a whole bunch of different courses at various levels of development whether it's in development or implementation. Um, so I would have to bring back what level they're at in the trades mm -hmm. section. We are rolling out um, new trades grants. Uh, I think it's $50,000 um, where, again, schools that are teachers that are doing innovative um, things within their schools are able to apply for grants uh, that support learning and trade. So that's a new program. I don't know if it's yet been rolled out, so I might be letting the cat out the bag. But yeah, yeah. Okay. Leader of the third party. Thank you. Um, so there's a. What are special projects for sixteen thousand? That would simply be for any small. Obviously, there's not a lot of money, but small projects that would come up during the year that uh, they want to fund within that budget. I lead a third party. Thank you, Chair. And <clears throat> junior achievement used to be under this section, was it? There is, I think, a small amount of funding within that special project for junior mm -hmm. achievement, if I remember correctly. Um, All right, Charles Conway, or do you, do you have the follow-up here? I do, but if you... Charles yeah, Conway, oh, okay, okay. lead a third party. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so last year there was more specifics in the budget for um, junior achievement, but this year it doesn't, it does, it's not included there. Has there been a change to the, to the program or the funding? Well, I think the, as far as our tabling documents go, I think the format's been the same, but I can bring back uh, over the two years what we've done with junior achievement. Okay. Mm -hmm. Charlottetown West Royalty. Thanks, Chair. Um, the literally, Literacy Alliance Operating Funding the summer tutoring program, uh, a very important program, that's only increased by four thousand dollars. Is that is that adequate, or is that what they what they would wanted? Or I I just feel like the needs are growing much more than that. 
So that would be a combination of uh, $50,000 for the summer tutoring program and uh, $159,000 for the core funding. And it's a multi-year agreement, so it's kind of set. Okay. Mm -hmm. Charlottetown West Royalty. So that's for like three years, and what was signed three years ago, two years ago? Uh, yeah, something. Okay, like yeah. Okay. Perfect. So no, it's just an important program for sure. Um, Charlottetown West yeah, Royalty. Yeah, I, I heard you talking, and I think that I was listening. I think that I was listening. <laughs> um, you were talking about the leaders in this section, and that's what that was, the, the leaders, because it's, it's very vague in here when we see leaders, and I'm, I know they're leaders, but I just don't know what they're leading. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, there would be... Um, a lot of them. Um, maybe we can get you an org chart to show, but there'd be math sure. and science and okay, arts yeah, and just different uh, yeah. specializations within the curriculum. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Charlottetown West Royalty. Because the next section where we talk a little, it gets a little bit deeper into literacy, coaching, and math, and but mm -hmm. I just didn't see it in this section. Um, there's a consultant. Uh, in here, uh, what was that con consultant? Is that a full-time consultant or? Uh, all, all of the positions listed are full-time. Okay. Charlottetown West Royalty. So it's a, a consultant on, uh, it's a C6. Which? which uh, in English Education Programs and Services. So it may, may be easier if I bring the org chart back and then you can see all the different ones. Um, okay. But yes, they're, those are the actual position titles, but you're Just right, they're not very detailed compared to an org chart. Yeah, so. yeah no, no, exactly. Um, I remember you're okay, already I look forward to getting that back. Thank you. Uh, leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, last year, the funding for um, the PEI Literacy Alliance was the operational funding was two hundred and twenty thousand, and this year it's been de decreased to two hundred and nine thousand. Is this because they spent less than they were budgeted for? The so forecast is two hundred and five thousand. Where are you seeing the budget is two hundred twenty thousand? Um, so the I'm looking the like last year's budget was two twenty. So I was looking at that's where I got that number. Um, and then now this year they're at 209000 So I'm just wondering. I'd, a, I'd have to look back at last year's budget, um, but our forecast was 205000 going up to 209000 So I'd have to look at the document that you're looking at from last year. Third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I know we've been talking for a few years now about a literacy strategy. Mm -hmm. um, so when can we expect to see that? Do you have any updates on, mm -hmm. on that? Yeah, so we completed um, the internal scan of all of our literacy programs within government. Um, currently, uh, Susie Du Bois, who's heading our, this work, is doing an external scan. I believe she's engaged with 75 different organizations across the island, so um, that work is underway. Um, I think it'll be, do you have any timelines there, Chris? And this time we can expect that to be done. Yeah. So this is sort of what we consider phase two of the project. <coughs> phase two began late 2023. Yeah. It's completing a scan of community-based programs and services to gather feedback and future opportunities. Mm -hmm. It's to complete an initial report on findings and develop a communication plan for public engagement, which will include sharing information on the current programs and services. You the third party? And I'm assuming that PI Literacy Alliance is involved in that? Yeah. Yeah. The my, third party? I think it's my last question. So I'm wondering if there's any innovative changes in this section that you'd like to brag about. <laughs> 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 and now's your chance. Innovative. It's a trap. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you all did already mention the, the new fund for um, trades. Yeah. Yeah, our outdoor education learning grants, those have been, uh, I guess they're not new specifically, but I think they're worth highlighting in here. Um, yeah, there's a lot of great things happening in this, um, this division, and my, big, my thanks to whoever's watching in the department for all the work that they do, because it's ongoing, all the work that needs to, be, needs to happen around curriculum development. It's, um, yeah. Tyne Valley Sherbrooke. Chair, she sparked. Uh, well, we'll go to lead a third party. Okay, my last question, unless you say something that sparks another one. Mm -hmm. Is there any updates? Like, I know we had talked about, uh, we passed a motion on play-based learning. Mm -hmm. Has there been any growth in that? Mm -hmm. 
part of the plan for this fiscal year, I do have under kindergarten, they're updating resources and professional learning on the continuum of play. Mm -hmm. <coughs> All right, Time Valley Sherbrooke. Sure. Um, just wondering, is there any um, additional finances or, the, or even additional curriculum towards the financial literacy program? At the, uh, in 24-25, at the high school level, there's financial literacy resources as a priority of this <coughs> section. As in, can you explain what it is, or? No, I'd probably have to bring back the <laughs> expert knowledge on curriculum <laughs> for that. <laughs> I, know, I know that there's work underway with junior achievement um, to develop some additional resources, especially with our exploratory <coughs> modules at the intermediate level um, so that again that work is underway and I think there'll be a real focus on entrepreneurship um, yes I know this is an area you're very passionate about yeah. I'm Valley Sherbo no, I'm good 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 tell it Carrie leadership and learning appropriations provided for instructional development and leadership training total leadership and learning three million two hundred eighty nine thousand six hundred Charlottetown West Royalty. Uh, thank you. So leadership and learning, um, important section. And that's what we were talking before. And, and in here we have uh, a few. Can you just tell me how, if I became a, an elementary literacy coach for the department, um, how you how you get out into the communities? Does, does everybody have a certain amount of schools they have to go to? And, and is, this, is this an issue? Um, literacy and, and, well, mathematics too would be another one. So how does that work? I'd have to bring back how they prioritize their schools and which classrooms. Um, yeah. I suspect they use um, some data um, and look at all the requests and, and prioritize them. I like down West Royalty. Because it's an issue, literacy is an issue, and, and we just talked about, um, you know, our intake is 3,300 mm -hmm. uh, people that may, maybe don't have English as a first language, does that affect the amount of literacy and how we're uh, the, liter the, the leaders here? Um, part of their priorities in the current year um, from the coaches is, is professional development for other teachers on foundations, a literacy program. Yeah. So. All right, lead a third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I'm wondering, so last year uh, the PEI Teachers Federation released the, uh, the pretty shocking report that exposed kind of how teachers were were feeling and, and some of the serious issues that they're facing. Um, and they reported, of course, high levels of burnout, unrealistic expectations, mm -hmm. complex and large classes. I'm wondering what we find in this budget to kind of start to address some of those challenges. I think as we'll, we get to the budget for both the CSLF and the PSB, you'll see the additional resources that we're adding, um, the frontline resources to help alleviate some of the pressures um, as it relates to both teachers and also educational assistance. We've made historic investments in educational assistance to help, again, um, ease some of the pressures within those classrooms. So I think that's primarily one of the ways in which we're supporting them. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. And, and I look forward to kind of getting into those details a little bit later to kind of talk about some of the things that we hear from teachers and what they need in terms of support, teachers and, and school staff. Yeah. So um, do you have, did you engage with PEITF to kind of make some of those decisions on, because what, I, I guess what, because of positions that, that have been hired, mm -hmm. I know that um, what, wherever I read it or, I guess it was in the but in the something that we got. It was saying that it was up to each school to decide what positions it was that they needed and, and that sort of thing. So is this something that you've worked with PEITF on? Sorry, specific to to kind of specific to what what yeah. initiatives that your department has created based on that report? Yeah, absolutely. The both boards would be in constant communication with the TF um, and as are we at the department level and ultimately the boards put forward their requests to the department so there would be a constant flow of communication with regards to the needs of the TF. 
You need a third party? And I guess I was a bit surprised not to kind of see a little bit more in that budget. It hasn't really increased a whole lot. Do we feel that that is enough to meet the, the kind of growing needs? This wouldn't be the section with the school-based staff. Mm -hmm. These are uh, coaches, but back in the PSB and CS left mm -hmm. sections, you'll see about 115 position, positions being added, I believe, so. Okay. You need a third party. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so the, uh, there's a lot of, in the staff list, when you look at them, there's a lot of math coaches and a lot of literacy coaches, which would have been true during my time as well, and that's mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. um, they do great work. Uh, but there's kind of seems to be some gaps in other areas, and have teachers ever asked for um, support in other areas outside of math and literacy? I'm thinking like sexual education, Indigenous studies, mm -hmm. um, civics education, whatever that is. Yeah, and I think that the department has always pivoted accordingly um, from my experience. If you look at um, diversity and inclusion, you know, we, we brought on Debbie Langston, for example, to build capacity um, within our school system and to help support our principals, our vice principals, and our, our teachers and staff. Um, also, social-emotional learning, that's something that our school staff have indicated as a priority for them in terms of learning and training, so we're, we are, we're providing that type of training. So again, I think those, um, there's some flexibility in the departmental roles, and if, in fact, they see an area where they'd like to dedicate additional resources, um, they do just that. Charlotte Thomas Rothy. Yeah, and um, just to pick up on, uh, <clears throat> we are adding teachers, and that's a good thing in, yeah. in, in the system. Um, but I, I'm just wondering, the, the, the numbers here, I just figured that shouldn't these sections, too, surrounding the teachers with education and, and learning both in these fields, shouldn't those go up, too? I don't really see a, a big increase. There's no additional staff. Um, do, you, do you find, is this a gap from the department? Do we need more in, into uh, leadership and learning? I think we, as a management team at the department, um, we added 100 staff to the school system last year and 115 this year. And um, we don't want to be a draw on that pool of employees. Like, we've been very successful in filling all those positions, um, but right now the focus is on the front lines. Charlottetown West Royalty. And that's a good point, because then I, I, I thought about that too. I was That's a lot of teachers, and we're in. They're, they're in high demand all over yeah. the country, so mm -hmm. uh, neither do I, but I, I want to make sure that they're, they're supported, which is a tough, da, tough balancing act with the department, mm -hmm. so I appreciate that answer. It, it's just that, that when, I, when I talk to teachers, they're, they're, they're doing such a good job, they're just, I don't know, it's hard to, they, they might be stressed at times, you know what I mean, they're, they're, they're taking on a lot, so I'm just trying to see where the supports are, so I, I appreciate that answer. Shall uh, I carry? No. Oh, it's Charlotte Conway's royalty. Sorry, sorry. I, I was just, I I was just providing the normal function of breathing. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, S school goal goals, training, and resources, forty nine thousand. It's static. Um, could you could you talk about um, what, why why is that number static from last year to this year? Uh, in consultation with the director of this division, uh, they didn't feel there was a need to increase that particular budget. And then the other 70000 is uh, a fixed amount based on the collective agreement. Okay. Charlotte Town West Royalty. So, school goals, training, and that would be training for the, the, uh, the math and literacy teachers, correct, in this section to provide the services, or is that... I, I, is that going directly to the schools? I think those are school-led initiatives that come to that division, but I can bring you back some information on what school goals are. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Shall I carry? Carry. All right. Total English education programs and services, 7409800 Shall I carry? Oh, leader of the third party. Um, so we've heard a lot about the lack of, of French teachers and, and French language substitutes, I guess, substitutes across the board, but speaking specifically to the French language mm -hmm. ones. Are there any contingency plans in place um, if we're not able to to find the correct amount of French teachers? I feel like this has been an issue for a long time, mm -hmm. and there's always been that concern about the quality of, of French education. Mm -hmm. So is there is the department working on anything to kind of to have those contingency plans in place in case we're not able to find enough French teachers? Mm -hmm. 
we're we're very aware of the issue. It's it is more challenging, as you say, to to find um, French teachers. And I do again give a lot of credit to the folks that are recruiting because last year we were able to fill all of our um, French teaching roles, which is fantastic. Um, and I know they're they're already very hard at it, trying to going across the country and, and working at recruitment fairs and trying and trying to anticipate um, for September as well. So there would be contingency plans in place, uh, but certainly um, we, it's it's an area of concern and uh, we need to make every effort to ensure that we um, continue the momentum. Lead yeah. a third party? Yeah, I can imagine that that yeah. is, is quite stressful. Yeah. Um, so one another concern that we've heard mm -hmm. from, from um, Islanders, and I guess I would be one of them even though I, but people who are not able to access French immersion programming in the school that they're zoned for, mm -hmm. um, and kind of the inequities that that, that, that presents, is that mm -hmm. something that the, um, and, I, and I recognize the last question I asked because that would, that would require more French teachers, mm -hmm. but is that a conversation that's being had at, or is that a conversation that you've ever been a part of in terms of in, like putting French immersion programming into all schools? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, in my time as minister, we haven't uh, rolled out any new French immersion programming in, an, in, in a new school. But that being said, we have had um, some schools come forward or some communities come forward. And I know our director, our new and previous one, always happy to engage with the community and the school um, to see if there's a desire and the demand um, to, to justify it. We just haven't. Um, there's been none brought to fruition. They've been able to find alternatives. And I, I, I know it is a concern for some parents. I think on Prince Edward Island, um, there's more access to French immersion than any other place in Canada. So we do have that going for us, which is wonderful. But again, I think it's incredibly important that we continue to try to support our French community and um, also our English community who wants to speak French or any community who wants to learn how to speak French. So, um, yeah. Leader of third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, do you, is, has there been a, an? In, oh, I, actually, never mind. I know the answer to that question. Yes, there has been an up, an increase in in students wanting French immersion programs. Mm -hmm. um, so at, I'm noticing there's no increase in grants here, and I'm wondering if the Minister for Francophone Affairs, if that's a conversation you had with him, and and that there was no need for for more grants there. There's more of a discussion with the director of this division, and uh, she felt with the budget that we put forward, she could execute her mandate. Leader, third party. Thank you, Chair. I think this is my last question. So there's $10,000 here for outdoor learning. Is there a similar grant for English education students? There is. It was, uh, they've grouped theirs, not for any reason, under material supplies and services. Um, so I believe they allocated $50,000 out of that pool of money for their outdoor learning. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Charlotte Thomas, royalty. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so the the French I don't I didn't hear the, the French teachers uh, bursary. Is, it's only five thousand um, dollars. Can you tell me what that's for and why? Is it obviously a recruit? Is it a recruitment bonus? It's a, a bursary for teachers pursuing French studies. Um, it's, this is a federally funded, I should mention, the 198000 is federally funded. Um, but like I said, over the past few years, they've been able to work within their budget. Shall I carry? No. Oh, you saw more? Shall I carry? Shall I carry? Shall I Yeah. I'll ask the question, or does the hour call? Yeah, well, yeah. What? Extend the hour? No. no. You can okay, extend it for go. sure. Go ahead. <laughs> This sec, go for it. Go for it, I dare you. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, I move that the speaker take the chair and that the chair report progress and beg leave to sit again. Shall I carry?
Mr. Speaker, as a chair of the committee of the whole House, having under consideration the grant and supply to His Majesty, I beg leave to report that the committee has made some progress and begs leave to sit again. I move the report of the committee be adopted. Shall I carry? Sure. Call on the member for Kingston Malpeck and the government house leader. Mr. Speaker, I move, second by Summerside Wilmot, that this house do adjourn until Thursday, March 7th at 1 p.m. Shall I carry? Make safe arrangements for tomorrow, everybody.